if you've got gut symptoms and brain symptoms and muscle and joints and you're fatigued and you've got skin problems, well, that's starting to sound like it. Every doctor, every general practitioner is seeing this every day. They just don't know about it. It's extremely common, you know, somewhere around 11 to 13% of the population. That's that's one around one in seven is actually suffering, not just talking about the susceptibility. This is actually who's got it. You don't want to be thinking of this condition as being that you're there's no way out of it. You can heal from this. And and that's my personal belief. You can heal from virtually any condition. This is Elia from EO Nutrition, and in today's interview, I am joined by Dr. Sandeep Gupta. He is considered one of the world leading experts in mold or biotoxin illness and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. This is otherwise abbreviated as CIRS. CIRS can mimic many different complex health conditions and for that reason is often misdiagnosed because doctors simply just don't know about it. They'll often meet the diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome uh, or fibromyalgia. Fatigue, anxiety, super common, insomnia, pain in the body, so that can be in the muscles, can be in the joints, it can be in both. You can get headaches. You can also get swelling in the brain, diarrhea, constipation, bloating. I've seen people who essentially cannot even get up for a shower right. uh, or, or virtually do anything. You're basically getting neuroinflammation. Um, you're gaining what we call microglial activation. If they develop enough inflammation of the white matter, which is basically the myelin sheaths around the nerves, well, that's multiple sclerosis right, right. there right. waiting to happen. The brain has become inflamed in some way, and in some cases, that's actually led to, to an atrophy. But many patients with, with CIRS are multiple chemical sensitive as well, and they certainly can be electrohypersensitive in some cases. As his name suggests, people who suffer from this condition suffer widespread inflammation in multiple systems of the body. And it's this widespread inflammation that can account for the multitude of symptoms that someone might develop. The classical symptoms of this condition are laid out in the clusters which are currently shown on screen. The main trigger for this is exposure to biotoxins. These are toxins produced by living organisms which if someone is exposed to, if they are susceptible, their body can't effectively clear them out because of changes in the immune response. The body is not really getting rid of them. It can be in some individuals that you just never turn off the inflammatory cycle because those biotoxins that were already there, you know, they're just, they're still in the system and they're, they're, you, you haven't interrupted their flow. I can almost guarantee that at least some of you have this condition and you don't know about it. And if you do, then anything else that you try to fix it is probably not going to work. If you, you haven't responded to basic functional medicine protocols, or you've got a multi-system illness like we've talked about, or you've, you've had some known exposure to water damage buildings and you're unwell, all of those things would lead you to highly suspect that you've got some type of mold-related illness. So first of all, he looks at the basics of what biotoxins are and what they do in the human body. Then we look at the symptoms. He then explains the treatment methods and the testing, how you can identify if this is a problem for you, how you can identify whether your house has had water damage or mold exposure how um, you can effectively clear these out of the body, what you might be able to do if you can't afford uh, functional medicine doctors to do the testing, if you can't afford to do the treatment protocols. There are lots of things that someone can do at home uh, for quite cheaply. Ultimately, he provides a lot of precious insight into how people can recover from this condition. So if you tried various diets, if you've tried different supplements, if you've tried different health protocols and none of it has helped you, in fact, it might have even made you worse, you need to watch this video. Sandy, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty relaxed. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks for having me on. Uh, right, so just so our listeners get a, a rough overview, you are a, an MD based in Australia, in Queensland, I believe, and you are mm -hmm. considered one of the world experts in mold-related illness, or to be more exact, falling under umbrella of what's called chronic inflammatory response syndrome, abbreviated CIRS. Could you just give us a brief overview? What got you interested in, uh, in the concept of CIRS and led you down this path? Yeah, sure. So 
I actually was a um, conventional doctor in all senses of the word initially. I went through the hospital system. Uh, I worked in emergency medicine, anesthetic, some of those kind of areas. And then I, I was actually working in intensive care. So looking after people who um, were very sick, acutely sick, and, and also particularly cardiac surgical patients and patients who had sepsis. Now, um, I really feel that intensive care is where modern medicine shines because, you know, just in that really acute situation, being able to get those treatments, you know, sometimes things as extreme as putting people on a ventilator machine and giving them inotropic medication to keep their blood pressure up was very, very um, useful and effective. But often I found that after they'd been in the intensive care, uh, they still had some lingering symptoms. So they might have had a bit of fatigue. They may have some joint pain. They may have found their memory wasn't quite as good as normal. Uh, and those things were often just dismissed. And so I started wondering, okay, is there something going on with these post-sepsis patients and uh, like a low-grade inflammation? And now my career slowly transitioned over to integrative medicine after I had a, a brush with um with candida actually. So I took some really strong antibiotics when I was in the United States uh, and I got a gut bug called Shigella. And at the time I was just in the medical model, you just take the antibiotic, you take the treatment that's needed for that bug and everything should be fine, right? But everything wasn't fine. I came home with 10 out of 10 headaches. I had no energy. Uh, I had, my gut was functioning very poorly. And I basically was bed bound. It was really, really bad. And so I went and saw a neurologist at the hospital where I was working and he, and, and to be fair, I pushed myself into his schedule, but he only saw me for literally two or three minutes, did a quick examination, said, yeah, you've got cluster headaches. And he gave me a prescription for 75 milligrams of prednisone daily, which is a very high dose. Uh, it's, it can be associated with psychosis and other things. And, you know, although I generally, am, you know, go along with the philosophy of just following what the doctor recommends, at that moment, my intuition kicked in very strongly. And I was like, no, no, no. He didn't even ask. Like, it's got to be due to the antibiotics. It's got to be. Um, you know, and, and there's got to be a solution there that doesn't in, involve just suppressing inflammation for long mm -hmm. periods of time. And so I just started researching um you know, at top speed, basically just looking up different sites and basically came to the idea that I developed candida due to these antibiotics and I developed leaky gut. And so I changed my diet. At, at the time, it was quite high carbohydrate and I was eating gluten and dairy and so on. Took them out of the diet and they had a, a really a very, um, a very strong effect. So it was actually a nurse at, at the hospital I was uh, working at uh, who basically said to me one day, actually saying, you know, your sinuses are always congested. You know, it could be the gluten and dairy. And in, in typical medical arrogance um, manner, I said, that's rubbish. It's nothing to do with it. Right. But I had that little bit of open mindedness. So I said, well, yeah, I can try. Yeah, sure. I'll try it. You know, I'll prove you wrong. <laughs> and and, and you so still benefit. It. Yeah. Well, the funny thing was I didn't notice anything until three, four weeks. But then I had, I remember the exact moment I put a piece of bread in the toaster and in the, in at work. And then I, I ate it and I was like, Oh my God, like my nasal passages were just, um, filling up with mucus, um, like in real time. <laughs> and it was like, Oh my God. So, so then that's one of the things sometimes you don't notice when you take away a trigger because it goes away gradually, but when you reintroduce it, all of a sudden, there you are. So anyway, so that was that was my journey into switching my cure around. So after a while, I started feeling like, hang on, I wouldn't be sincere here if I if I'm not actually offering this as part of my practice, because you know I got almost totally better in about one or two months, and so I was very lucky. Yeah. Uh, so I just decided to transition over. I did like a full fellowship program in integrative medicine and also my general practice training, open my own practice. Now, one year after doing that, after opening my own practice, uh, my house flooded and my, yeah, my ex-wife and myself were, were both affected by it, but particularly her. 
And she, you know, she was basically, you know, she was bed bound. She was, she, you know, she was unable to really do anything. And she just said she had no energy. She was just had a massive amount of inflammation. She was getting a lot of joint pains, et cetera. And I really couldn't understand. I didn't have a framework for understanding what was going on. Mm. Now, around that exact time, there was one patient who came in and started telling me about Dr. Richie Shoemaker and said she had heard a interview with Dr. McCullough with Dr. Shoemaker, and there was a test called the visual contrast test that she had done, mm-hmm. and she had failed it, and she wanted a prescription for cholestyramine. I had no idea what she was talking <laughs> about <laughs> did, at the did, time. Did you prescribe it her? Yeah, I did. I went and looked it up, and I thought, well, okay, it's relatively safe. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what cholestyramine is going to do for you, but anyway, here you go. Right. Uh, and you know, so so that was my, my my view was if people wanted to go on their own self healing path, as long as it was safe, I didn't really have any objection. Uh, and then I searched the site and found out, oh, hang on, they've got a physician training. So I basically just signed up straight away, no questions asked. Uh, <laughs> signed up, and it took me six months to get onto Doctor Shoemaker. And uh, I used to have to Skype with him at uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, wow. our time, because he was only in his office for literally three, four hours a day. And that basically corresponded to 1 to 4 a.m., possibly right. the, the, the worst possible timing for Australia. But I was determined, so I did it. And, yeah, it was it was a steep learning path, man. Like, I I didn't know what he was talking about to start mm-hmm. with. Like, he was, he was, he was saying, hey, so you got the C4E and the TGF beta 1 and and <laughs> – I was like, no, no, no. I just want to know about mold. Um, so <laughs> he sent me a few thousand page documents to read. It's like, okay, right. thanks. <laughs> and he sent me a, a written exam with a whole bunch of questions. Now, the funny thing was none of the answers were actually in those documents. <laughs> so it was a lot of reading and it was, it was a very, it was a very roundabout way of learning it. Like there was the WHO guidelines and what was called the GAO government accountability office guidelines and all these other um, documents that were, you know, it was a little bit rambly really. And it didn't get right to it. And so, you know, that was one of the reasons I created my course, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which basically because I didn't want people to have to go through that if they're suffering with, with mold related illness to have to go through this really, really long and convoluted way of learning it. I, I think it's much better just go straight to the concepts. <clears throat> so, so basically what I found out is there is a condition called CIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Now, Dr. Shoemaker's hypothesis at the time is there's around about a quarter of the population who have a genetic susceptibility when they're exposed to a water damaged building. That's one that's had um, water into the substance of the building for 24 hours or longer, or sorry, 48 hours or longer, rather. And um, then their body turns on an inflammatory response, which involves all body systems, and they start. Um, expressing sim- signs and symptoms in a multitude of body systems, um, which are all basically linked to chronic inflammation. So, so that that was my first little bit of um, insight that I developed into what was going on, and and it was due to to toxins primarily, according to his framework. And one of the key was just to get the toxins out. So first thing is don't get any more toxins in. So you had to get away from the source of the the water damage building, if you like, and you had to start binding it with cholestyramine or a similar binder. And then there was a whole bunch of treatment steps then that to kind of help to reduce inflammation and uh, and turn off that whole inflammatory cycle that was taking place. Right, so um, it, it, it's interesting reading the the story of how he came across that. Right, it, what was it like a a, a bloom? Is it basically, yeah, a, like yeah, a cyanobacteria. Blue green, yeah. Well, no, this was fisteria. Right. Uh, and yeah, so he lives in in an area near, near the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, and so uh, it, that bay had developed this outbreak of it's it's called a dinoflagellate. It's an organism that gets into waterways. And uh, so he had this one patient come to him who had diarrhea amongst a bunch of other things. 
Mm-hmm. So diarrhea, but she also had joint pain. She also had brain fog. And he thought, okay, I can sort your diarrhea out. Mm-hmm. Here's some cholestyramine. But to his surprise, all the symptoms went, got better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really interesting story of how this came about. And then looking into, I, I, just to give people some context, um, th- this was once called, what was it? Water damage building syndrome. Is that is that a sick no sick building syndrome? A sick building syndrome, right? So it's been associated yeah. with with uh, mycotoxins produced by yeah. mold species which are living in buildings, right. but but really it, it can be caused by anything that's referred to as a biotoxin. So a toxin exactly. produced by some kind of a living organism. This can be one that lives in the sea. This can be uh, bacteria. It can be uh, mold. It can be any anything that's living that's generating these toxins. Uh, but then thinking is also come come forward since then and and it's am i correct in saying that it can also be produced by other toxins as well not necessarily just biotoxins is that correct or or not well it's no it's thought to be due to the these small negatively charged toxins you know that he just that that the original research team described that basically they're what you call ionophores so they get into cells and they uh, in, in people who are not able to process them properly, they set off um, the innate immune response uh, to be firing off on an ongoing basis. Now, as you know, the innate immune response is kind of an ineffective immune response that, that initially fires off when any foreign material comes into the body. And that's kind of the precursor for the um, acquired immune response, which is a much more effective and targeted um type of uh, immunity. Now, what happens in CRS is they never develop that that proper targeted immunity. They just have this dysfunctional, ineffective immune response, uh, which actually becomes the illness itself. Right. So, so just so I understand this, and so that others do as well, is is um, there are or well, there seems to be. Is it correct in saying there's a, a, a subpopulation of people? A certain proportion, and it's estimated to be what between like fifteen and twenty five percent. Twenty five, yeah. Let's say that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And because of certain genetics, we can talk about what that might be. Yep. Um, essentially, people are coming into contact with uh, biotoxins on a regular basis. Let's say there are lots of sources of biotoxins, and for the healthy body or for someone who is not susceptible, well, the there will be this initial. Uh, kind of uh, immune response though so so the in, innate immune response identifies it but then yeah. you have the communication with another portion of the immune system which essentially tags it builds up antibodies yeah. and can then clear it out of the body right so that's the normal right. response and that's going to cause a very minimal inflammatory right. reaction and so for the majority of people, they're not going to have necessarily these problems with biotoxins because, yep, they can see it and it might cause a, a small amount of, of, of inflammation, but then their body just identifies it, builds up uh, an adaptive uh, antibody reaction and the body can get rid of it, right? But mm-hmm. with a certain population of people that you're d- referring to, there's there's a miscommunication between the innate and the adaptive immune systems, mm-hmm. right? And so... Right. For those people, what you're saying is, if I'm correct, is that uh, they have this innate inflammatory reaction, but they can't build up the antibody or tagging system to get it out of the body. So what happens? Does it does it stay there? Does the biotoxin just yeah. stay in the body? Yeah, just stays in the cells. Um, a small amount are, are moving around, and and the body just recirculates them. Is uh, was the was the belief system. So so what happens is you know some some of the biotoxins which get into the blood are excreted into the bile, and they are not bound onto anything. So they tend to be then reabsorbed back into the bloodstream again, and then they recirculate. And so the body is not really getting rid of them. And it, it, it struggles to get rid of them until you know some external help is brought in. And there's this concept mm-hmm. that by because they go to the liver, the stuff that's floating around in the blood, it goes to the liver and the body needs to get rid of it. And the way that it gets rid of it is through the bile, correct? But there's right. the issue of, of reabsorption in the gut. Could you yeah. speak a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so what happens is if uh, often 
when different compounds are excreted into the bile, um, they're still sort of com compartmentalized a little bit. Now, um, they're often also connected to another compound called glucuronide group. And now what can happen is if you've got the wrong gut flora and there's got a lot of beta glucuronidase, then it'll tend to uncouple that and then the then the compound just tends to get reabsorbed again in the small intestine. And so unless you've kind of found a way to break that cycle, the body doesn't really excrete any any significant amount of mycotoxins. Okay, so it's being dumped into the gut and then basically mm -hmm. reabsorbed when it gets further down into into the gut and then yep. recycled through the liver and then so basically yeah. just constantly recycled it's like it, yeah. it's yeah. not yeah and some of that'll go anywhere. back into yeah some of that'll go back into the cells and then some you know there's a little bit of exchange between the cells and the blood is my understanding um, uh, but the majority of the mycotoxins seem to and and the other toxins uh seem to hang out in the cells Right. And when they're in the cells, that's being picked up by the innate immune system, which is basically telling the body to ramp up inflammation, right? Right. Exactly. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's telling the body there is a foreign threat here. So um, go on to high alert, which should be, a, you know, a little bit of an innate inflammation followed by a lot of proper acquired inflammation, acquired immunity. But in this case, you never, never make that connection, and it just, you know, you just get this chaotic and ineffective immune response, which is never really, never really works. Okay, and that chaotic, like relentless immune response, that can basically help to explain many of the symptoms, like you said, which are in multiple different systems. So, could you tell us a little bit about the kind of signs and symptoms, or the progression of symptoms that someone might experience? If they are in this situation, if they're one of the minority who cannot effectively tag and clear out mycotoxins or biotoxins yeah, sure. in general, yeah, sure, yeah. Well, so the the symptoms can involve any body symptom, uh, body system rather, and some of the really common ones are fatigue, anxiety, super common, uh, insomnia. That's really really common. Uh, you just find you just can't sleep, and um, there's a lot of sleep disturbance that happens pain in the body so that can be in the muscles can be in the joints it can be in both that's very very common uh you can get headaches a certain amount of headaches that can be due particularly to, there's a dehydration that also happens in CIRS due to the fact that one of the hormones which usually regulates the amount of fluid in the body becomes low which is called ADH and so that on its own can cause headaches you can also get swelling in the brain uh, due to CRS, which can cause headaches. So that's definitely one. And then gut symptoms, that's definitely part of it. Uh, so you can get, you know, diarrhea, constipation, bloating. One of the reasons for that is that it's common to get SIBO uh, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in concert with CRS uh, or, or mold illness of any type. And, and I will just jump in and say that this CRS is not the only type of, of mold-related illness, by the way. You can get more of an infection or a colonization of the of the mold itself. Like, you know, so often in conventional medicine, that's referred to as aspergillosis, but that's only one type. There's many, as you know, there's many more mold species than just aspergillus, but that's one type. They also were looking at um, mucormycosis, another type, which was being looked at um, in India during the COVID-19 um, pandemic thing because uh, a lot of people who had COVID-19 were getting that type of fungus mm. in their lungs. They were getting much higher mortality with COVID-19 when they developed that fungus. So there is other ones as well. Of course, you know, you can get virtually all of the different uh, fungal species can colonize the body. You can get penicillium, you can get cladosporium, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's definitely you know, that's definitely a real thing, but that's not part of the original description of CRS, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. And then, and then thirdly, you can get basically an, an allergy. You can have mold allergy, which typically is not very severe, but in some cases it can be. Uh, and then you can get um, just general metabolic changes due to mold and mycotoxins. Um, which can include things like your neurotransmitters going down and developing a bit of depression due to that, uh, developing oxalates 
which can cause a, you know, we'll probably talk about that further as we go along, but that can cause a whole bunch of different nutrient deficiencies and, and that can cause pain in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, there's a wide range of other things that, that, uh, my, my, mycotoxins rather, sorry, um, can cause. Right. Um, and the, uh, there's a lot of, I would say sham diagnosis or let's say conditions which can be mimicked by this, right? So for instance, uh, at least from the population that I've worked with people who, um, tick many of the boxes and the testing for CIRS, oftentimes they will have been dis um, diagnosed as having fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, some pretty significant changes to the autonomic nervous system as well. So a lot of these people are diagnosed with idiopathic uh, POTS, postural orthostatic yep. tachycardia. Yep. Um, so is, is that correct in saying that th this condition or this wider umbrella of CIRS can basically look like from a clinical perspective or diagnostic perspective, it can tick many of the boxes for other conditions and people are often missed because they get given these diagnoses. Um, yeah. Is, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Like they'll often meet the, they'll often meet the diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome uh, or fibromyalgia. And so if, CIRS or mold illness is not in your uh, diagnostic umbrella, then they're probably the best, the best diagnoses you know you you can find for that situation. But the problem is they don't they don't give you any idea of the cause, and so for a general sort of a general practitioner or a general physician, um, the treatment for those is just things like um, graduated exercise therapy and cognitive behavior therapy and stuff like that. And, and particularly the first one, the graduated exercise therapy really doesn't work in CRS until you've really improved the inflammation. It actually makes people worse. Right. And so, so therefore it's not as helpful if someone just diagnose, um, diagnoses chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, because the problem is you don't get to specific enough treatments that way. Right. And let's say you had an open-minded physician who is not necessarily trained in how to identify CIRS, would this show up on any of the standard um, blood blood chemistry panels? Say, for instance, we've got this concept, what you're saying is, mm -hmm. is that these biotoxins stick around in the body, they're picked up by the immune system, and that is triggering chronic inflammation. But would that be reflected in, let's say, a CRP or an ESR measurement? Would it show up on a blood test or would it not? Generally not, no, because it's a different pathway of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So if your physician is in the United States, uh, it's reasonably easy for them to just go ahead and order some of these um, other inflammatory markers such as C4A, uh, MMP9, and TGF beta one, and they pick up the correct pathway of inflammation, which is actually affected by this condition. Okay, so there's a very specific set of labs that really need to be conducted, and there's something that most yep. doctors won't be running on a regular basis, right? Ex exactly right. You know, there's others such. You know, you may see some changes in things like sodium levels and cortisol and DHEA and things like that. That still generally only functional medicine doctors are doing. Right. Um, but but you're not going to get specific. Uh, you're not going to see a specific change for CIRS unless you do some of these um, other inflammatory markers. Now, though, even if you've got the abnormal pattern, so the classic pattern is you've got elevation in C4A. MMP9 and TGF beta one amongst others. And then you're getting lowering of VIP and ACTH and MSH. I know it's a bit of an alphabet soup, but uh, if you, if you can get some of these labs done, it definitely points you to the area that the patient's problem is somewhere in that biotoxin quadrant, I call it. And, it, you know, they're not in the more, basic functional medicine quadrant. Mm -hmm. I believe Andrew Heyman refers to it as functional medicine 2.0, where, you know, looking at conditions such as CRS, muscle activation, uh, you know, 
Lyme disease, all of these things, they're in the bio, biotoxin quadrant, I say. Right. And the 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 more basic functional medicine quadrant is where things where people have things like microbiome disruption, nutrition deficiency, mitochondrial dysfunction, mm-hmm. heavy metals. Heavy metals is a classic one that's going to put up the ESR and CRP. Mm-hmm. And then the other simple one is just dietary mistakes. You know, people just eating too much carbohydrates and sugar, et cetera, that's going to start putting up ESR and CRP and certainly insulin and blood sugar. Right. So that's got its own little pattern. Or now, even there the- may be a little bit of crossover, but uh, but if you start seeing these other inflammatory markers really elevated, then that's going to point towards um, CRS and or something in the biotoxin quadrant for sure. Sorry, you were saying? No, no, sorry. I, I- I think there's a bit of a lag, but um, no, I was going to say even just standard, uh, let's say diet induced or gut induced autoimmunity. You know, there are a a lot of people who have been diagnosed with say rheumatoid arthritis or lupus Mm -hmm. or whatever it is that respond pretty marvelously to diet. But then when you get into the territory of CIRS, uh, it turns out that that can also be one of the things that contributes towards autoimmunity, right? But yes, these people yes. usually will not respond to the classical, um, let's say, functional medicine protocols, which look at improving the gut, which look at reducing the autoimmune uh, response, taking, identifying food, uh, alle- uh, food uh, immune immune reactivity, getting on, uh, you know, certain diets, for instance, the carnival diet or the elimination diet. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes people mm-hmm. with CRS, they just do not respond in the way that the protocols or the, or the, or the, the way that other people do. And so that's where it gets kind of complex. But you, you highlighted something interesting there. You, you spoke about MCAS and this is, really, uh, I think, an animal of its own. And and there's a a wide community of people who have something which uh, equates or something which looks like uh, MCAS. MCAS, for those who don't know, is mast cell activation uh, disorder. And uh, oftentimes for these people, and I'd be interesting to find or to hear what you found with this, but there are supplements which are said to help with reducing histamine or reducing mass mass cell activation. Um, And those are going to be like your uh, diamine oxidase, DAO enzyme. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you've got certain mass cell stabilizers, quercetin, et cetera. Um, But what have you found with CIRS patients? Because MCAS is quite common in people with biotoxin illness, right? So do they generally respond to those kind of classical mast cell stabilizing therapies or is it something that they've got MCAS until they deal with the uh, original cause of inflammation which is the biotoxin okay we've got a bunch of th- we've got a bunch of questions there Sorry, i'm actually going to start Sandy. with the <laughs> that's okay that's cool <laughs> no i'm liking it um i'm going to start with the first thing you talked about because i definitely think that's worth highlighting which is just talking about functional medicine protocols and how crs patients don't respond to them uh, this is really important to understand because if you yourself are a patient and you're not getting joy through those standard kind of um, microbiome type of manipulation and mitochondrial supplements and um, nutritional supplements of various types, um, that's actually a really strong indicator that you may have something going on in this biotoxin sphere. And you know what was happening in the past quite a lot, and so, let, you know, particularly there's there's um, a certain range of practitioners who focus on these things, and particularly focus on, you know, maybe it's carnivore diet and low carb diet, which of course are extremely powerful. But if then what was happening, if someone doesn't respond, they would then almost uh, accuse them of not following it properly, and there'd be that kind of sort of dynamic going on. And I just so people are aware that can go a bit too far. Look, I mean. Yeah, the thing is, if someone's following it 95% of the time, a small slip up here or there should not be um, should not be causing the whole program to not be effective at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. And so if you're finding that you're really getting no benefit whatsoever, despite basically following it you know, to 95% or better, and you may be sneaking a chocolate bar here or there, uh, <laughs> um, I still think that that's going to be an indicator that there's something else going on. And particularly if that's happened for six to 12 months, I would say you definitely need to start um, exploring another area, this mm-hmm. whole bio, the biotoxin quadrant, where you start thinking about 
uh, CRS, mast cell activation, Lyme disease and co-infections. Um, those would be the big three. And finding, you know, and, and basically having some some testing and some evaluation done for those. So that's the first part. I just wanted to to really highlight that. And the second part was about specifically going into mast cell activation, right? And so the way I see it, and and just to be clear, I don't think mold and dampness are the only cause uh, of mast cell activation. Mm -hmm. There are some people who who react to to various other things such as food or medications, uh, or and, and in some cases there's a variety of things going on. But the the cases that I've seen generally mold is a huge factor. And, uh, and so in those cases, I see it as being like a sister condition to CRS. It's almost like a variant. Mm -hmm. And so with the, the original description of CRS, which says that, um, in certain genetically susceptible people on exposure to biotoxins, they develop this, uh, chronic and ineffective, um, immune response that's basically is run by the white blood cells. Well, the original research group didn't actually specify which are the white blood cells that um, are being hyperactivated. So it's quite likely that the mast cells are almost always involved to some degree, but in some patients, it, it's they are the predominant cell that's involved. So that's how that's how I guess I see it as being a variant or a subtype. Now, Dr. Tanya Dempsey recently came out saying that CIRS is simply MCAS, and I gave this a lot of thought, and I want to just briefly um, mention this, why I don't believe that's true. Um, and, and one of the, the big reasons is the response to VIP. Mm. Because if it was just M uh, mast cell activation, using the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, which usually comes as a nasal spray, would not, be, would not at all be affected, uh, expected to be effective. Because that actually, if anything, that can trigger mast cells more. But in many patients who we consider to be CIRS, uh, they have a dramatic response to, to vasoactive intestinal polypeptide and to other steps of this classic CIRS protocol. So I do want to say at this stage, I do just want to, um, I do think that they are separate entities at this point. Um, unless I get more information that um, points me in another direction, I definitely feel there is two separate variants. Now, the most important reason to know if someone with CRS is, is more mast cell uh, dominant, let's say, is that it's highly likely they're going to react to elements of the protocol un until you have calmed down their mast cells. And so... Yeah. So generally speaking, that's in those people that you identify are mast cell dominant cases, let's say, uh, you'll need, and, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be that they're getting a lot of burning or flushing or itching, which are a little bit more clues that the, the mast cells are, and histamine um, are active in the system. Uh, it can be that they're also abnormally reactive to various formulas, whether they be medications or supplements. Uh, there are some other little clues there as well um, that you could even, you know, that you can pick up even that go back to their past history from childhood and so on. So if you, you pick that up, then generally the first thing would be for to trial them on a low histamine diet, which just takes out those foods that, that um, trigger histamine. Uh, in a big way or contain histamine in a big way. So there's two different types of foods and, uh, and then putting them on some preparations. So it can be, as you said, DAO enzymes, quercetin. I do also use the medications, ketotifen, sodium chromoglycate, and then the H1 and H2 blockers uh, in many cases, but I get them compounded because as Dr. Afrin says, who's, who's considered the world expert in mast cell activation, uh, often the, Patients or, or clients with mast cell activation respond to the uh, non-active ingredients or excipients yeah. in classic pharmaceutical medications. So I try and just um, try and bypass that from happening by just using compounded uh, medications to start with, where a compounding pharmacy or a compounding chemist um, do up the medication and they use only very benign fillers like um, cellulose and so on. 
interesting you say that. Uh, seems to be the same for nutritional supplements as well. So the magnesium stearate tends to be yep. a problem. Yep. Um, I mean, that is known to cause anaphylaxis in, in some people. I have an interview with a, a lady who... Um, who had been diagnosed with EDS, so Ellis Danlos, and she'd yeah. had all kinds of joint issues, very, very hyperreactive immune system, and she could not take anything which contained magnesium stearate. So there are only like a couple of supplement companies that do um, manufacture supplements or, like you say, compounding pharmacies for pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. uh, without the additional fillers. The problem is it's, it's, it costs more to make those products because ultimately yes. the fillers exist because it, it makes it easier to run through the machines. So if you don't do that, then ultimately it takes more manpower for them to basically declog the machines when they're making it. Um, so, But yeah, that is a, a very important point is that these people are super sensitive to all of um, the additional supplements of fillers. So sometimes it can be that they try something and they attribute the problem to the uh, nutrient or to the drug itself when actually it's the excipient. Uh, so that can be problematic as well. But just coming back to what you were saying um, prior to this, we've you've, you've made some mention about VIP, MSH, um, ACTH, yep. all of these yep. letters. And for the people who don't know this what i'll do is I'll, I'll add some links to the description um and some diagrams to this video but basically yeah. what those are abbreviations for are for um uh, molecules or hormones or molecules mm -hmm. used by the human body right C could you explain what what these abbreviations are so as per the let's say the way that um shoemaker and his colleagues have laid out yep. the progression of what actually happens because there's there's not only just this chronic uh, innate in inflammation but that has knock or let's say downstream effects on multiple different different systems like you said and one of those is the hormonal balance and, and all of the things that's going on in the brain and then how mm -hmm. that's controlling the rest of the body so could you give a brief overview of the kind of things or the the biomarkers what they do and, and why they're important to measure and what that reflects in the human body yeah, absolutely. So the first category I talked about is uh, what we call cytokine markers. Um, and cytokines are compounds that fuel the fire of inflammation in the body. That's the, the terminology that I use. So they're little compounds that are sent by white, white blood cells so that the body realizes there's a, there's an area that needs attention, if you like, and for the 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 immune cells of the body to to concentrate there and create an inflammatory response. Inflammatory response is basically helpful when it's short term and effective, and it's harmful when it's long term and unable to be controlled. So um, so in out of the cytokines, the first one's called. Um, C4A. So that's a split product of complement C4. Now, uh, C4 is a classic or, or is a standard test done by, um, particularly by rheumatology doctors, look, you know, looking for lowered levels, particularly in autoimmune disease. So it's a non-specific marker of autoimmune disease. But when it gets split into the C4A, that's more specific for biotoxin illness. So that's a really important one. Now, the next one's called transforming growth factor beta one. Uh, and that's very been very extensively researched. And we know that it goes up in autoimmune conditions. We know it goes up in fibrotic conditions. So there's something called, um, you know, so for instance, nasal polyps or um, there's something called fibrosing lung diseases where people develop or interstitial lung disease where people develop, um, I guess you could say, inflammatory fluid inside their lungs for various causes. We know that TGF-beta goes up in their case. We know people have heart surgery, their TGF-beta one goes up. So there are a lot of other causes. But when you see it in concert with these other markers, that's when it's uh, specific for CRS. So none of these markers in, in and of themselves are diagnostic. It's the combination. So, yeah, the third one is is matrix metalloproteinase nine or MMP nine. Uh, that's been studied quite extensively in cancer, and it's also a marker for mast cell activation. So that's another little thing to mention. There's a little bit of a different pattern of these blood tests in mast cell activation versus the classic CIRS. So in mast cell activation, you'll see that the MMP nine is particularly elevated. 
There's also a bunch of other biomarkers that can be used. According to Dr. Afrin, the serum heparin is the most useful test. Now, that's one that's not available in, in many areas, but in the United States, it can certainly be done. I believe it's by Quest. Uh, so that's probably the most useful one if you're looking specifically for mast cell. Mm -hmm. There's also the urinary prostaglandin. Uh, one of the urinary prostaglandin markers I think, uh, is um, very sensitive and and specific. Um, so the, there's really there's really ten or twenty different blood tests and urine tests you can do for mast cell activation. But if the MMP9 is particularly elevated, that can be a strong pointer to the fact that this is a mast cell dominant situation. So so then the other group of markers were what we call neurohumoral markers, meaning that they're they're basically regulators of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And and so when they go down, it means the body's able to uh, basically go into an inflammatory state in an uncontrolled manner because they don't have this control from these markers, if you like. And so first one, VIP, is uh, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, so not very important peptide. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the second one is melanocyte-stimulating hormone. And, uh, and, and that's, that's been studied for, uh, weight gain. So low levels of, of melanocyte stimulating hormone are associated with high weight. And, uh, that's really the hormone that the original research team was saying is that the, that's the first one that gets affected mm -hmm. and then everything else comes after that. So that's really, really common. Basically, virtually everyone with CRS has a low level of that. And then we've got ACTH, which is the adrenocorticotropic hormone. Um, and then you've also got um, VEGF, which is the vascular endothelial growth factor. That's uh, been very, very well studied in the literature, particularly to do with cancer. Right. Okay. And sorry, just to interject, the MSH, this is, this is important so that people understand. If you lose the function of MSH or if MSH becomes low, that has like innumerable knock-on effects on the neurological system and the rest of the hormones, right? So it's not just like you have one chemical which it becomes low. Uh, it's like you have knock-on effects onto almost every Ooh. single system just because that becomes reduced. Is, is, that, is that a right way of looking at it? Yeah, particularly if there's ongoing biotoxin exposure. Now, I have seen some people who just have low MSH, and I think of that as being like a pre-CIRS situation, right? Where they, yeah, where they're 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 likely to get it if they get a significant exposure. So it is possible to just get that in isolation, uh, and it may in some cases also be due to gut problems, mm -hmm. gastrointestinal problems. Uh, but in many cases, yeah, if if you get that low MSH and you've got some ongoing biotoxin exposure, you're going to get those flow that domino effect of those cytokine markers going high and those other neurohumoral markers going low. Okay, so as long as someone is exposed, there's this, uh, Heyman has described it as a progressive condition, right? So for instance, it may start with some mild symptoms, say if someone's had water damage, mm -hmm. like or like yep. you were describing your previous partner, there'd been a flood, you may, uh, I mean, what was her progression like? Or what is the typical pro progression? Would it start as maybe fatigue or a headache or uh, brain mm -hmm. fog or something? And then gradually over time, as long as someone is continually exposed, it starts becoming then multi-system and multi-symptom, right? Yeah. If so, as long as someone's continuously ex exposed, they explode. I liked your little... Um... <laughs> Your little slip of the tongue, though. <laughs> right. I mean, it's kind of true. The, the inflammation though, right? explodes. Yeah. yeah. The, the inflammation explodes. So, so often, yeah. One thing I find is often if the sleep goes off, that that will then bring in the fatigue because you can't, you know, if you're if you're sleeping poorly for a long period of time, you're just not gonna you're gonna start feeling really bad mm -hmm. because you're just not getting that rejuvenation of the body. So that's often that'll often be the first thing, one of the first things to to start, and anxiety and a bit of insomnia. And slowly that then can then domino over into and into a lot of fatigue and and pain and 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 gut problems after that. Right. And eventually it may end up with someone being literally bedbound, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. I've seen people who 
essentially cannot even get up for a shower right. uh, or, or virtually do anything. And I've had actually seen someone have a cardiac arrest due to mold, so it can get very, very bad. Wow! And you can get you can get Alzheimer's disease due to to mold, definitely. Probably other neurodegenerative conditions. So I do believe in some cases it can become life threatening. Can be very, very severe. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Alzheimer's. I mean, in your course, which I just want to say is absolutely fantastic and really good for. Um, it's it's really excellent for people who are not trained medically, although it is also excellent for practitioners. I can see how that would be great. But it's it's particularly useful because what you basically do is you distill everything down into uh you you, you maintain the complexity, but you put it in simplified language and you explain it very well. So I think it's it's an excellent introduction. It really is. And it, basically there's hours of material where you cover like almost every single aspect of like uh identification, treatment, um before after everything like that so i just want to yeah. add that in there that i was super impressed I, I purchased it in in 2020 um and and i and i had watched it back then but i recently went back to it in preparation for this interview and it was just looking back um it really helped solidify my understanding although it's very basic understanding of the process and, and grok the, the details uh, but as an aside um uh, sorry i've lost my train of thought we were just talking about uh where were we the cytokine the cytokine markers msh and how an isolated um deficiency of msh can be a domino effect and can uh cause you to get all these other cytokine markers and then the symptoms people often have right to symptoms. start with yeah Oh, okay. They okay. often have the, the anxiety and insomnia. That's one pattern. And then they start getting a lot of fatigue, pain, and digestive problems. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I still got, I had a very specific question I was leading up to before I started talking about your course. It was about, um, oh, what were you saying? So you're saying about some people, ah, right. Okay. On the topic of neurodegeneration, which you, which you did cover on your course, um, mm -hmm. It, I mean, it's interesting, although there may not be any direct research, although I think that there, there is, mm -hmm. uh, there, mm -hmm. there is at least direct research for some of the inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. There's a couple of yes. case studies, I believe, where you've got like ulcerative colitis, which goes into remission after biotoxin, after the mycotoxins yes. have been identified and, and remediated and things. But uh, yeah. I mean, from an indirect, at least from a mechanistic perspective, we can understand, I think, uh, why or how uh, this this CIRS underlying process, this chronic inflammatory response syndrome, can lead to practically any type of neurodegeneration or any other condition, particularly neurodegeneration, because uh, from what the, the way that I understand it, at least, is that one of the central themes or underlying processes is neuroinflammation which occurs, right? Or which right. at least in its end stages. And if you look at much of the research on say Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis, there is there seems to be a direct correlation um, between those conditions or the onset of those conditions and this neuroinflammatory process, which can sometimes go on for 10, 20 years before the diagno diagnosis is actually met. So would that be a way to at least speculate how CIRS could cause or at least contribute to many of the so-called uncurable brain conditions that seemingly no, have no cause. I'm not saying it, it, they could be the only cause, but because mm -hmm. of that mechanistic link, you know, is, is it safe to say that it could, it could contribute to almost anything? Absolutely. I mean, you're basically getting neuroinflammation. Um, you're gaining what we call microglial activation. Now, what we mean by that is the immune system, the immune cells of the brain are becoming activated. They often create uh, a compound called NMDA, and that's causing inflammation in the nerve cells. Now, a test that we often use to look at this is called NeuroQuant. Now, NeuroQuant is a computerized analysis of brain MRI. Uh, it's performed in, in by Cortex Labs in San Diego. But you, there's certain... Uh, imaging companies all around the world, actually, who are able to perform an MRI and send it off for neuroquant analysis. Now, what we see in people who have severe CIRS is that they've got a whole range of different brain areas which are either shrunken or enlarged. So we call it atrophy is the mm -hmm. technical term for shrinkage and hypertrophy, technical term for enlargement. And so... 
really what that is showing is neuroinflammation. That's showing that the, the, the brain has become inflamed in some way. And in some cases that's actually led to, to an atrophy. And that can be, as I say, it can be very severe and it can go all the way through to dementia. In other cases, people can have very severe cognitive defects, like things like I've seen people who are unable to take in information at all. They can't, you know, not remember people's faces at all. It could be their expression of information is, is greatly affected. Uh, there's a whole range of, uh, of different, um, different symptoms they can develop as, as a result of that. And particularly in cases like you can see the pattern on the neuroquant, if they develop enough inflammation of the white matter, which is basically the myelin sheaths around the nerves, well, that's multiple sclerosis right, right. there. Right. waiting to happen right uh, and and so in, in there's other patterns if it's more to do with uh the basal ganglia area of the brain if that neuroinflammation gets bad enough there's enough atrophy well that's parkinson's waiting to happen so there are a lot of different uh a lot of different diseases which can be um, can be related to to mold exposure, especially if there's a genetic susceptibility or another factor involved that can push the person down that path. Okay, and and on on that topic of genetic susceptibility, we we touched on that, but could you just give us a, another another overview? So, how many people? First of all, what are these genes, or what are they known as? Are they easy to test for? Are they included on, say, a standard panel like Twenty Three and Me, or are there more specific yeah. tests that need to be done? Yeah. So so with regard to genetics, the original research team mainly looked at uh, a set of genes called HLA, which relate to uh, human leukocyte antigen. And that has to do with how the body responds to foreign invaders. And they stated that there's certain uh, variations of these genes uh, that when a person gets exposure to biotoxin, they basically are unable to recognize it because of their HLA genes. Now, as, and I will mention now, as the experience in this condition has increased uh, and more and more research teams and treatment teams are looking at it, the more, I guess you could say, additional factors are starting to become uh, part of our understanding of CRS. There's a whole new group now, which is called ICI or the International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illness. And that includes doctors such as Dr. Mary Ackerley and Dr. Suzanne Gazda uh, and many, many other excellent um, doctors. And so what they've found is that they're probably the, the original research was a bit simplistic and there probably is other genes involved as well. So there's one called ABCC, for instance, which has got to do with transforming or transporting rather um, mycotoxins in and out of the cell. So a mutation there could cause a problem. There could be mutations regarding oxalates. There could be mutations regarding mast cells. There could yeah. be mutations regarding nitric oxide. And so um, Bob Miller, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you know him, but he's developed a very sophisticated system of nutrigenomic analysis. Yeah. And so you can do that through his website, uh, which I believe is dnasupplementation.com. But going back to the going back to the HLA, if you want to look at your HLA genes, uh, you can do it through. If you're in the United States, LabCorp is the recommended lab for that. If you're in Australia, it's Sonic. Uh, I'm not sure what, which lab people would use out your way, but basically, what they need to do is find a lab which will actually give the number. So there is a crossover with what's known as the celiac disease gene testing. But the problem is if if you're doing a test for celiac disease genes and they just report it as yes or no, well, that's not going to be quite good enough. You need you need a test where they they basically are giving you the exact numbers for mm -hmm. what's known as the HLA DRB1, DQB1, and ideally the DRB3, 4, and 5 uh, genes. 
So if you can get those done, look, I do think there probably is some more susceptibility um, according to your HLA genes, but I, it's probably not as much as as was initially thought by the initial research team. And I do think we need a, a proper study looking at all the different genetics and probably Bob Miller is, is probably in the best position to do something like that. Right. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so, so you can get a little bit of, I think if you just do 23andMe, you'll just get like a green depending on which um, program you use to interpret it, you'll often just get a green or an orange or a red light. That's not really, it's not really going to be enough information for you to decide if you've got, because it, really what you need to do is go to survivingmold.com um, laboratory tests. And then there's something called a Rosetta stone there with all the different gene types. Right. And you can find out which gene type you are. I have found that, you know, so, so the original, um, the original description is that there's certain ge genetic types which are mold susceptible and certain are Lyme susceptible and then certain are multi-susceptible, meaning they're susceptible to all types of biotoxins. I have actually found that's quite misleading. Uh, and so, for instance, if you find someone who has a mold susceptible gene, there's still every chance that their main problem is actually Lyme disease. Mm. So... I just recommend taking it with a bit of a grain of salt, but having said that, it also gives you a little bit of a, it gives you a little bit more information. So I do it in some cases now, but it's not, it's not part of every case because also the other thing we want to mention is you don't want to start thinking about the fact that you don't want to be thinking of this condition as being that you're, there's no way out of it and that you've just got the gene and you've got it forever. There's nothing you can do about it. You want to really go into the the type of thinking that there is, you know, you can heal from this. And and that's my personal belief. You can heal from virtually any condition, whether or not there's a genetic susceptibility, because it's it's ultimately epigenetics, right. which has the primary role. And that's that's what I was just about to ask about, because you could you can be given a, a template, let's say, which is your your genes, which are basically set in stone. But it's how your body is expressing those based on your environmental conditions, your beliefs, your your thoughts, the health of your body, your sleep cycle, etc. There's just innumerable things that aren't understood. I mean, it's so complex the 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 science of epigenetics is like every single year there's a new amazing discovery which basically like uh doesn't necessarily disprove what was thought but but questions some pretty long-held assumptions in that field so it seems as though um there's just so much that we don't understand or isn't understood about the way that the human body actually works and that if someone someone like you said i mean the the work on crs or the doctors that have been working on it more recently have discovered well actually there's probably a bunch of other different genes that are involved yeah. in determining this so it's not quite as simple as as doing the hla sequence i, I just wanted you to you to discuss that because there are people who are interested in doing that however um one other important point is that a lot of the people with CIRS actually don't they don't necessarily have the financial resources to be able to invest uh a, a lot of money maybe they have very limited health insurance maybe they're not in a country that even offers these kinds of tests so i'd like you to just to uh, discuss something a little bit about that like what can someone do let's say and i'll put the the symptom clusters and and the kind of i'll add some extra information to this to this interview uh, but but ultimately what can someone do if they Fig figure that they um, they fit the clinical phenotype. They have the symptoms. They have the signs. They have the history of having or potentially having CIRS. Uh, how can they get a better indication as to whether this actually applies to them? One, if they don't have the access to say neuroquant analysis, if they don't have the access to their HLA gene tests, or if mm -hmm. they don't, if they can't afford things like TGF beta C4A MSH, is there? Uh, what about something like a VCS test? What have you found in your experience? How accurate is that? Yeah, that's a great question. The VCS test is a reasonable screening test, uh, but it's probably only positive in 50% of cases, i found. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it may, yeah, 50 to 60%, let's say. Now, the, use, the good thing is if it is positive in you, it is quite a useful progress marker. So I definitely say everyone should do it. But if you don't show a positive, that doesn't exclude the diagnosis. Uh, if it does show positive, there's definitely, I mean, you, you know, you've got to exclude any eye conditions for sure, because that can cause it as well. 
Uh, but it's, it basically is a general marker of neuroinflammation. So if you're positive, that, that usually is going to be a, a strong indicator that you've got something going on in that biotoxin quadrant. Again, you know, whether it's, it's, it's most accurately described as CRS or Lyme in co-infection or, or mast cell activation syndrome is still yet to be seen, but it's, it's useful in that way. Now, if it's positive, you want to see that there's an improvement every month or two months when you're on the treatment. Otherwise, you know, the, it suggests that you're not really moving forward as well as you, you should. I've also seen people get the handheld held kit and use that as part of testing a home or building. So for instance, testing your VCS outside and then going into the building and testing your VCS afterwards. Wow. And I, that can be very useful. I had a, a situation where I had a mold problem in my my in one of the other houses after my original one that flooded. And by using the VCS test, I was able to identify which room was the problem. So so it can be used for that. Now, um, so so that's the first thing. Cluster analysis can be useful as well, which is basically just looking at how multi-system is your illness. So for instance, if your condition is only involves bloating and diarrhea, that's only one system. Yeah. If it if it only involves insomnia and let's say um, a little bit of anxiety, that's only one system. If it only involves joint and muscle pains, that's only one system. But if you've got all of those, if you've got you know if you've got gut symptoms and brain symptoms and muscle and joints and you're fatigued and you've got skin problems well that's starting to sound like it right. <laughs> that's much more likely to be CRS because inflammation in like the whole body inflammation process like this generally involves multiple systems so that's some things now the third thing is obviously doing a thorough check of your home environment to see if there's any smells or um, visual mold. Now, if you've got, if you've got, uh, basically, you know, you, you've got mold which is visible, then you've got a problem, basically. Now, to f the next question is, is your, or if you've got, if you've got obvious odors, yeah, without any inspection, you can say that home or that building has a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, now whether that building is causing your symptoms. The, and we go into this in a lot of detail in your course. One simple way of doing it without tests is do a mold sabbatical. So that means taking, it's taking uh, usually one or two weeks minimum uh, away from that building. And most ideally you go tent camping because the problem with just saying, oh, okay, I'm going to go to my friend Billy's home is this is every chance that Billy's home's um, contaminated as well. Right. In the, in the, in the modern world, unfortunately, most buildings have problems. I don't know if it's a, it's, it's as a big of an issue in the UK as it is in Australia. It's and, bad. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've seen some people who are from the UK, so I imagine it is. So, uh, I know France is a problem too. I've seen a number of people who say that, that the buildings in France are a, a real issue. So, so yeah. So if you do that and you notice, uh, you know, that you have a significant improvement and then you come back to the building and you notice that there is a uh, recurrence of symptoms, just like me with the toast and the toaster, all of a sudden noticing that my nasal passages started congesting in, in, in real time. If the same thing happens to you and coming back into your home or your your joints start hurting or your fatigue and insomnia start to come back straight away as soon as you've gone back to that house, that's a very strong indicator that that home is causing you, is linked to your symptoms. And, you know, that's all you need to take action, really. It doesn't always have to be fancy tests. Right. Uh, there are. There are a number, I will mention a number of other tests that can also be done, if that's okay, yeah. uh, just so people have all the information. Uh, so we've talked about neuroquantum, we've talked about those, um, the blood tests that can be done. There's also testing for mycotoxins, and that can be done in the urine or in the serum. And uh, so urinary mycotoxin ca testing can be done with real-time laboratories, Great Plains or Vibrant Laboratories, I think all out of America. I think there is a German laboratory as well who does it. I think it may be Armin Labs. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and then you can do serum mycotoxin antibody testing. That can be done through my myco labs in America, or there's another lab I've saw who who is doing it out of Germany. So so for European uh, for European clients, I do think that looking at some of these German labs, they're starting to get quite good technology going, mm -hmm. uh, and. So far, it seems that the serum mycotoxin antibody testing is more accurate in terms of exposure, right? knowing whether there's current exposure. The urinary mycotoxin test does give you a bit of a indicator as to how well you're excreting and just, you know, your total body load. It may give an indicator of your total body load, particularly if you're doing a provoked test with glutathione and sauna, mm -hmm. which is really only recommended for real-time laboratories. Right. Okay. Because okay, that's the potential issue, right? Is that if someone does have the classical CIRS phenotype, let's say, then mm -hmm. their issue is getting it, getting mycotoxins out of the body. Like that is yeah. part, that is the driver of the pathology itself. So it wouldn't be um, difficult to imagine that someone who does have a significant mycotoxin load because of this problem with actually getting out of the body that they may have a low level on in urine right but you're saying maybe yes. if you provoke it so you use something like glutathione and what sauna yeah. to help it get yeah, sauna, out yeah. of the body kind of initiate that process kick start it into gear um you're saying that that may be a better way um to to ascertain whether someone has that or not right yeah, I think you're less likely to get a negative test there. But these days, I would say, particularly with uh, Great Plains Lab, if you see a totally normal test, a totally zero mycotoxins, I believe that's actually abnormal because I believe virtually everyone has a small amount of exposure in huh. their daily life. And so you you do want to see just a tiny bit. And often the most common ones, you should see a tiny bit of ochratoxin and mycophenolic acid. Right. That's my that's my understanding. But there's certain levels, and Dr. Neil Nathan is one of the um, the doctors and researchers who's trying to establish some normal ranges. So he says anything above eight on the ochratoxin is probably starting to get above um, normal. And there's some other reference ranges for some of the other markers that he's developed. So uh, so it can be done. But what you don't want to do is just hang your hat on the urine mycotoxin test. And so there's a little bit of a trend in the functional medicine movement uh, in the United States. And certainly not all practitioners. I'm not saying that. But there's a, there's a little subtype who like to see someone and then say, OK, we're going to do five, six tests. And, you know, these are my standard five, six tests, and then we'll decide what you've got. And they, you know, there's a, sometimes they're not doing a really good history and so on. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is you should be able to generally tell someone's got CRS mainly from the history. But what mm -hmm. you don't want to do is say, okay, I don't know what's going on with you. Here's the mycotoxin test. Oh, it shows a bit of mold. You've got, you've got mold. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not quite as sophisticated as we want to be doing things. You want to really um, be do a history of when have they had exposure to water damage buildings and was there any relation to the timing of their symptoms. And sometimes you'll find someone who has a lot of fatigue and headaches and and other whole body symptoms. When they go back and, and think about their history of, of homes and so on, it's like, ah, actually, yeah, that home I was living in in 1997 actually did have a problem and when i moved into it it was actually only a couple of years after that uh that that i did develop problems yeah and that 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 leads me to another question which is actually one of my um followers asked uh, that's something i've seen as well working with people and that's a, a major red flag there but the question is how long does that persist for you know is that potentially indefinite so you have someone let's say for example 10 years ago they're living in a moldy apartment and mm -hmm. uh, very clear identification that that's when their symptoms started right but yep. then they've since moved somewhere um, and there's no identifiable mold. There's no identifiable driver of the of the condition that they or, or let's say there's yeah there's there's yep. there's mm -hmm. they even test their apartment and there's nothing. Can CIRS say they develop this I inflammatory reaction and and they got a big body burden of mycotoxins ten years ago? Can that persist? You know, do the changes in inflammatory gene expression and whatnot do they persist? Can that persist for five, 10 years? 
or is there a limit to how long it can persist for? As far as I understand, there's no limit. If you haven't had treatment, it can be in some individuals that you just never turn off the inflammatory cycle because those biotoxins that were already there, you know, they're just, they're still in the system and they're, they're, you, you haven't interrupted their flow. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have done binders and you still find you're unwell, then there's every chance you're actually colonized with mold in the body and that the mold in your body is actually creating mycotoxins uh, rather than the environment. So you've insert, you've sort of got a water damage building inside your body. Interesting. Now the, the commonest, the commonest sites for that will be the sinuses and the lungs and the gastrointestinal system. Uh, so you can do organic acid testing, particularly with grain, great plains laboratory can be a good indicator. The mm -hmm. other thing I do is the nasal, nasal swab testing with microbiology DX doing the fungal culture will often show something. And then you can do, um, various type of gut microbiome testing, such as the GI map testing to see if they, they're showing anything, uh, in, in terms, that'll be usually more in terms of yeast rather than mold that they're testing for. But, uh, if that's the case, then you do need to use something to actually kill the mold itself. Now, that wasn't part of the original CRS treatment protocol, mm -hmm. but I am I think most of the ICI members now are quite convinced that that's needed in, in certain cases. Now, what you don't want to do in, in most of the time is, is give antifungal treatment, but not do binders. So you don't want to do it on its own. But sometimes you do need to add that in. Now, that could be pharmaceutical medications like itraconazole or more, more commonly it would be herbs. Right. Now, things like powder, arco, reishi mushroom, uh, thyme, nigella, etc. Yeah. That can be quite useful uh, in, in lowering, in actually helping to knock out that colonization in the body. Uh, so that the body is able to heal. Because uh, if you've got a factory of mycotoxins in your body, you can imagine that it's a very uphill battle. That's fascinating that you say that in the way that th thinking has come along. Because I, no. again, from when I originally looked into Shoemaker's work and, and, and the kind of original concepts that were laid out, um, it, was, it was cautious, let's say, um, to... There, there, the thinking was, at least my impression of it at the time, was that, look, this is not mold colonization. Do not get these concepts mixed up. Oftentimes, these right. people are not colonized with mold. CRS is the immune system defect that's the problem. But it would make intuitive sense, at least, is that if someone's living in a moldy building and they're exposed to not only a massive influx of mycotoxins, they're also exposed to live organisms. And if we look yeah. at the immune system problems that can occur... Yes, you get um, you get you get uncontrolled innate in, 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 inflammation, but that only manifests in certain ways. Like over the long term, I, I I think I'm correct in saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that your your um, your immunity against foreign pathogens can then actually become decreased. So you lose the ability to modulate what grows and what doesn't grow on your mucosal tissue. For instance, you might end up with low, low amounts of uh, secretory IgA in the mucosa, whether it's the lungs, the nasal passages, like or the gut, like you said. And so not only do you have this kind of uncontrolled, relentless inflammation in certain areas of the body, but you actually lose the ability to prevent colonization of pathogens other areas of the body you can't you can no longer protect yourself so it would make sense at least that mm, someone absolutely. could then become colonized and so that absolutely and 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 i think it's also a function of just the amount of mold they're exposed to as well right 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 and and so they're uh, interesting the way that you say they basically become a water damage building internally um, yeah. and they need to fix that. And that's interesting because, again, clinically, at least anecdotally, there are just so many people in this community, at least from what I've seen, who benefit pretty substantially from taking antifungals. Um, substantially, and that's whether it's a nasal treatments, whether it is something like... Neb Would you use some kind of a nebulized substance uh, to get to the lungs? You can. You can, for sure. And there's actually a, a herbal compound called 98 Alive, which is produced in Australia, which is, um, it's actually from Melaleuca oil. That's, I found that to be very useful. But outside of that, you can use things like um, HOCL, which is hypochlorous acid. I know Dr. Klinghardt, Dietrich Klinghardt is a big advocate of that. You can also use silver. 
Uh, there's a variety of other substances. I believe you can nebulize iodine as well. Yeah. Uh, so so there's a number of substances you can nebulize, but it's just, you know, you just got to be a bit careful because when you're nebulizing a substance, it's also going to be getting into the lung. So it is a bit more sensitive. Um, so you can't nebulize everything. Uh, so there's some compounds I would use in, you know, in, for instance, a neti pot, but mm -hmm. I possibly wouldn't put in a nebulizer. But yeah, a nebulizer can be, yeah, is, is very important, particularly if there's any lung involvement. Other topic I was going to just speak about, Elliot, if it's okay, is um, EMFs. So electromagnetic frequencies. There, that's something that's always around us. As you know, anyone who's carrying a mobile phone or cell phone is getting a certain amount of electromagnetic frequencies. If you've got a Wi-Fi modem on at home or in your workplace, you're going to be exposed to a certain type of uh, EMF. Uh, there's, there's many other types. You know, they're coming from mobile phone towers, etc. Now, is this significant? for someone who has developed mold illness or is having mold related illness of some type? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Now, one of the reasons is that we know from some of the research has suggested that in a high MF environment, uh, mold will tend to produce more mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, when you think about it, even if you're in a high MF environment, even a smaller amount of mold is likely to be more uh, harmful. And so therefore, as part of an overall holistic approach to this, I do think that it's very important to have a look at the EMF in your home environment uh, or and or work environment. And so one of the some of the simple things you can do uh, is just turning off your your home Wi-Fi. If you can turn it off all the time and just wire in your internet, that's the ideal thing. And particularly if you own the house that you're living in, that's generally, it's a very worthwhile investment. You know, often you need to get an electrician to just have your, your internet properly wired into the house. If you're renting, there are some options available. For instance, power over ethernet, where you have basically plugs that you plug into the power that you actually run the ethernet cable into. Mm -hmm. And and most people can do that. Sometimes you may need a little bit of electrical work done in your home uh, to accommodate that. But uh, in, in many cases, uh, you can run totally wired internet at your home. And that includes actually wiring your, your tablets. So you can get adapters for ethernet that, that plug into in iPads or other brands of tablets. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very useful if, if you can, do, particularly if you've noticed that you're EMF sensitive. Uh, but, but oftentimes you don't know until you actually uh, try turning it off, try reducing your EMF. You, you may not know because you may never have been in a low EMF environment other than for a couple of one-off camping trips. And so, so doing that, the second thing is on your mobile phone or your cell phone, uh, making sure you don't keep all the antennas on that aren't needed to be on. So when I'm talking about antennas, I mean things like the Wi-Fi uh, reception and Bluetooth and cellular data. If you turn those three things off and also location settings, you're massively reducing the amount of EMF coming from your cell phone. Mm -hmm. So those are the two really simple things you can do uh, that, that may well help. Uh, we do also have a short course called EMFs Made Simple that goes into all of that. And I believe that's also a really important thing for people who are suffering from mold-related illness to address in their homes. I didn't know that you, you had that course as well. That's interesting. I'll check that out. Um, one thing, and another thing which, which I developed into a habit probably 10, 10 years ago now was just sticking it on flight mode when you're not using it. Now, if you're on Absolutely. call for a job or something, sometimes that's not even yep. possible. Although with every like couple of centimeters away, the power or the, the EMF exposure decreases exponentially. So just yes. having it on the yep. other side of the room is going to be significantly yes. better than having it in your pocket. But I mean, the best case scenario is just to stick it on flight mode and then turn it on when yep. you're going to make a call. At the same time, for instance, when I'm speaking, I will use, uh, again, another habit, which I just don't even think about now, was just using speakerphone. So I never put this thing directly up to my head. 
I just use it on speakerphone, and that's something mm-hmm. that's quite normal. Of course, certain situations you need to you need to use it, but ultimately, yeah. it's no. it's cumulative exposure that's the problem, right? But something exactly. that I've I've personally found um, is that people with this condition or who I think have this condition tend to um, tend to be more acutely aware of their exposure in terms of their bodily sensations. So there's there's the few people who who are aware um, of when they're in an EMF environment. Some people might notice tingling or neuropathy or like a headache mm-hmm. or something like that. Have you noticed um, that tendency in your patient population that people with CIRS or these other kind of neuroinflammatory conditions um, tend to be more sensitive in terms of their symptoms when they come into contact with EMF? There seems to be a subtype of them or a sub subgroup of them rather. Uh, who who have that sensitivity. And probably if I've made any connection, it'd be the ones who are more mast cell dominant. Interesting. So there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely a subgroup. And they're often, you know, they they often react to chemicals as well. But many patients with, with CIRS are multiple chemical sensitive as well. And they certainly can be electro hypersensitive in some cases, um, which is it's quite tricky because it's hard to escape all EMF. Right, and and you're probably familiar with Dr. Martin Paul, right? You yes, know about his work, and it's I was interesting. Just trying, I was just getting in touch with touch with him recently, actually, for an uh, interview. He has some very interesting theories, um, which tie together this the concept or the underlying mechanism behind multiple chemical sensitivity and EMF. Uh, I, w- I won't say yeah. sensitivity because I think everyone's sensitive to it, but people who are mm-hmm. particularly noticed that their symptoms are exacerbated when they come into contact. And at least his working model of uh, multiple chemical sensitivity, I found fascinating and it does jive with what I personally found as well, is that a lot of it is brain based and it has to do with this, mm-hmm. like you were mentioning, uh, the NMDA receptor system where you have mm-hmm. this reduced threshold for uh, excitotoxicity or excitation. So basically the nerve cells firing at a certain rate in response to glutamate or any of the other neurotransmitters. And these NMDA receptors are normally kind of guarded by a threshold. So your neurons aren't constantly firing. But in people who have EMF uh, exposure or sensitivity, let's say, or multiple chemical sensitivity, there is this reduced threshold. And therefore, when they come into contact with these things, it causes this massive, like, excitotoxic storm in the brain. And this, uh, you know, like downstream neuroinflammatory process which is occurring because the nerves are the neurons are going crazy um and and i think that that would better help to explain at least multiple chemical sensitivity um as opposed to impaired liver detoxification which i personally find that detoxification detoxification protocols aren't quite as effective for people with this problem although you think that they would be um because their issue seems to be neurologically based, at least. Uh, And it is interesting, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that EMF does stimulate that glutamate NMDA receptor system and does trigger neuron firing, and that's one of the mechanisms behind eventual cell death in the brain. Um, But the sad thing is is that a lot of people just don't, don't get the symptoms. They don't even know that they've got a problem. But this leads me to another question, which is actually... Um, which I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, is do you think, because you have this interaction between EMF exposure and, like you said, when mold species are exposed to this, they they release more mycotoxins. I assume that's some kind of a stress response or an adaptation or something. Do you think that that might be one of the reasons why so many people in our kind of modern day world are experiencing massive problems with CIRS or mycotoxin related illness. Whereas if you go back 100 years, people were also exposed to mold, but the the rate of chronic illness was not the same. Do you think that it might have something to do with the onset of EMF exposure over the past couple of decades? I do think that's one factor. I do think the other factor that's involved is just to do with modern housing um, and construction techniques. And that, you know, very much, you know, they're basically built on a very short schedule, houses these days, and companies are are under a lot of pressure to, to construct houses very quickly. So the same level of workmanship doesn't seem to be there anymore. And so that that can go all the way down to the materials that are used, to just the waterproofing, 
uh, of the wet areas in the home, like the bathrooms, and even simple things like the joins between the floors and the, the walls and so on may be at a poorer standard. Now, the, the other factor, which has also come to my attention recently, is the whole um, property investment craze. And so, um, you know, it's been promoted a lot that, hey, if you want to get wealthy, buy buy seven properties, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, and and get the rent up and so on, and, and there'll be a passive income, which, of course, is true and can be done. But see, the problem with that is a person who's just purchased a property as an investment is generally just seeing it as a economic um, modality, right? Or an economic unit. They're not thinking in any way about the actual environment they're, pro they're providing for mm. the tenant, generally speaking, unless they live just down the road, which is very unusual. Usually people are buying investment properties in distant cities and so on. And so they may never even, you know, never or barely ever even cite the, the property. And so basically they're wanting to keep their costs down and if any maintenance requests come in for instance oh there appears to be some damp you know some some mold odor coming through generally what will happen is they'll just go for the cheapest and most basic approach to it oh yeah yes let's just spray some essential oils in there or right. spray some bleach or just paint over the mold or whatever it might be because again the 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 um, trend towards um, investment, property investment, has just you know, taught people that this is just an economic unit. Just get rid of any problems as quickly as you can and keep collecting money. Mm -hmm. Now, that that's a big problem because, again, we, we've gone away from this idea where people are house proud. And right. they're they're living, you know, they're they're living in their own home. They're taking care of the house properly. They're really attending to maintenance problems, you know, properly. And and making sure the price is properly you know upkept, and I don't know about the UK, but in Australia it's a very common problem that a tenant will mention to a real estate agent that they've got some problems with the mold, and the real estate agent will basically either dismiss it or will employ very very ineffective and superficial methods um, to try and treat it, such as just painting over it, which is really an abomination. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and obviously the problem goes on getting worse until, you know, some of the property, rental properties I have seen in Australia that people are living in, absolutely, you know, yeah, they're inhabitable, really, but so, they're not being recognized as being inhabitable. It's the same in the UK. And I think part of the problem as well is that the, I'm not sure what it's like in Australia, is that the, the amount of properties that are being rented has skyrocketed because people generally can't afford to buy their own yeah. home. So not only are they personally less invested in upkeeping it and making sure that it's properly maintained, but you have what you're describing where you have the, uh, you have the tenant who's less invested, but you also have the, the, the owner who's renting it out, who is also less invested and is doing it primarily for uh, business. So ultimately they're going to take short, shortcuts they're going to cut corners and you have basically the uh new home buyers which is very difficult to get a mortgage these days unless you're on a pretty substantial wage um mm -hmm. so yeah it's compounded the problem but then this also leads me to another question which was one of my uh followers but i think is probably relevant also do you think that the We've seen a lot of changes over the past, say, 50 years with the intake of processed food, synthetic chemicals, industrial chemicals in the household. We have this onslaught, aside from EMF, we have an onslaught of things which have the potential to be poisonous or toxic to the human body. So we have nutrient deficiencies, we have heavy metals in the soils, we have uh, heavy metal exposure elsewhere, we have all of these toxins that humans are coming into contact with. You were talking about this underlying, let's say, genetic or more accurately described epigenetic uh, switch, let's say, where someone's CIRS profile can, can become manifest. They may not have it early on in life, but then all of a sudden their genes are expressed for some reason, they develop this problem. Do you think that the, the bombardment of the human body with all of these other toxins coupled with the shit diets, excuse my French, the poor quality diets that people have generally subsided on, um, both 
uh, us and then our ancestors, our immediate ancestors, because there is this also this epigenetic link. If your parents or your grandparents subsided on a poor quality diet or exposed to toxins, we know that the evidence shows that um, there's more likely to be health problems or epigenetic issues, uh, genetic expression of certain inflammatory genes in the offspring. So do you think that that may also play a role in the human body simply is just a baseline level of inflammation or oxidative stress, which is slightly higher or maybe substantially higher than it was just, say, 30, 40 years ago? Do you think that that's involved somehow? It probably is. You know, there, there hasn't been any research specifically on that, but it certainly appeals to common sense. I know that that some uh, physicians like Dr. Jill Carnahan talk about the concept of the total toxic load being key. And so, therefore, there probably is a synergy between all different types of, of toxins, such as heavy metals, chemical toxins, um, biotoxins, etc. And as we know, you know, heavy metals are basically inhibitors of um, minerals, right, in general. And so, for instance, cadmium will inhibit zinc, et cetera. You know, mercury takes out the selenium, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so, therefore, if you don't have these basic nutritional elements available, you're going to have, you're already biochemically weakened, you could say, your body in general. And that it would stand to reason then that, that you'll have a lower threshold for some other kind of toxin coming and triggering off an inflammatory cascade. Interesting that you mentioned zinc and selenium. Both are pretty central to the immune system. And you're talking mm -hmm. previously about things like MSH or VIP or these other immune regulators, which are mm -hmm. basically responsible for, you know, modulating and turning down and switching off the inflammatory response, which we know is like the thing that's gone awry in, in CIRS. Um, I think at least, like you said, it kind of makes intuitive sense or common sense that if you tank out those minerals, which are really important for modulating the immune system, then you might be more, not, more likely to have an immune, immune system problem at least it makes sense to me anyway. Um, but uh, Absolutely. And we find quite often that people with CIRS have a condition called pyroluria, yeah. where they're excreting too much zinc and B6, and they often have a overload of copper. And so it, it's quite that it appears to me that normalizing that does appear to help. Now, we don't know the mechanism at this point, And there was some fear at one point that giving someone zinc supplements would put up their MMP9 levels because it's a zinc dependent enzyme. But that hasn't really hasn't really been found to be an issue in clinical practice. It appears to be quite helpful to be using that kind of supplementation. Right. And on so on the topic of other things which can cause problems for the immune system, um, you, was, you also have spoken about um, Lyme co-infections, uh, these yep. things. And so, so what we're talking about, and there are some distinct clinical, say, or laboratory characteristics, perhaps to someone who has, or at least on the neuroquant, someone who has mold related illness right or i think i remember right. that from your course you can yeah. somewhat distinguish between someone who has mold related cirs compared with someone who has say lime related cirs right. there's but some, as a, yeah there's some distinguishing factors but yeah. as a general kind of way of looking at things um it is true that co-infections and lime um and other things can can also lead to cirs right because of the biotoxins right. could you explain that a bit more yeah, sure. So basically, particularly Borrelia, Borrelia is the causative organism of Lyme disease in a classical sense. Uh, the way most practitioners who are what we call Lyme literate refer to Lyme disease is actually a combination of up to nine or 10 different organisms. Probably the most important ones are what we call Babesia bartonella in addition to the Borrelia and also Mycoplasma and Chlamydia. There are some other ones as well, like Rickettsia and Ehrlichia. Um, so pretty complicated names there as well. But the thing is the the Borrelia and Babesia are the ones that have been found that can create biotoxins. Now, 
The thing to understand is when you've got those infections, the infection or colonization piece is major. You can't ignore that. So if someone, for instance, has a tick bite, you wouldn't want to be just giving them cholestyramine and binders. You absolutely need to actually knock out the organism. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in, in, if it's just acute, acute tick bite, often the treatment only needs to be for many weeks let's say six weeks as a general rule to eight weeks, okay? And it may be antibiotics or it may be herbal. Uh, and, and so in those cases, I do advocate antibiotics in general, particularly if someone has a weakened system and they've got a tick bite. I've had a couple of tick bites myself. Mm -hmm. um, however, if it's long-term, let's say, let's say the person had a tick bite in 1991 uh, and they started developing problems much later. Now, firstly, I want to say one of the reasons can be that they've had a mold exposure. And initially, the infections were actually in control of the immune system. But then they had, it's either they had a mold exposure or an EMF exposure, actually, it could be either, that has then led that organism to be able to proliferate out of control and to be able to escape the immune defenses. So in, in those cases, so you probably have biotoxins from the water damage building and from the organisms themselves. So you're definitely going to need binders, but you're definitely going to need specific antimicrobials mm -hmm. for the infections. Now, one of the key is you've got to identify which co-infections are present. Now, you can do that by uh, symptoms. You can do that by testing. Now, there's a couple of, you know, there's some labs which have been around for a long time, which are still the gold standard, which is mainly Igenex in the um, in United States. Uh, Armin Labs in Germany also has a very mm. good reputation. Uh, you can definitely do that testing. It's generally expensive. It will be more than $1,000 in many mm. cases. Uh, if, you, if you're in the United States, you may well get um, the Igenex testing um, covered. Uh, but then you need to then go on treatment for each of these. Now, in general, if it's long term, I'm more an advocate of of things like herbs plus ozone therapy together. Um, so in those cases, you need to give treatment for the Lyme and co-infections at the same time as treating the CIRS, um, at the same time as mitigating EMF. So in practice, it, it can be quite complicated what you're looking at. And and the idea of just following the CIRS treatment protocol has slowly, slowly kind of gone out the window. Mm -hmm. And as, as energy medicine is being used more and more in my practice, I'm realizing it's very individual. So for instance, a, a treatment protocol for one person could include uh, using some well coal or colocevalam, which is similar to colostyramine, plus some bentonite clay, plus a little bit of charcoal, plus some Beyond Balance and BioPure herbs for the, the Lyme and co-infections, um, plus having an EMF canopy, uh, plus doing some quercetin and sodium chromoglycate for the mast cell activation. Mm -hmm. So that would be that would be a, a an example, plus doing a formula for pyroluria. So there's a whole bunch of, it's a whole web of factors that's often going on in reality. And so more and more I've started taking that systems approach to dealing with all the different problems rather than strictly following the the, the CIRS treatment protocol, even though that that has been very helpful for many people, just realizing, you know, understanding that concept of how that inflammation uh, comes in and, and really takes over the whole body. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, so to add to that, you, you mentioned, say if someone had Lyme or Babesia or something of that sort, and they didn't have exposure to mycotoxins, mm -hmm. could they theoretically still develop CIRS just from having the Lyme in and of itself? Because I, I know that Andrew Heyman has spoken a lot about post-Lyme Lyme syndrome. For those who don't know, it's basically when mm -hmm. people diagnosed with classical Lyme disease or some of the co-infections or whatever. They go through the treatment protocol and then they retest and there's no identifiable markers of Lyme disease. And they don't even necessarily have all of the symptoms that they had, but they 
are still basically debilitated. They have the symptoms which look awfully similar to what you know as like a multi-system, multi-symptom illness <laughs> like CIRS. And um, at least Heyman has said that he believes that a significant proportion of post-Lyme syndrome patients actually have CIRS. And I believe the mechanism was thought to be that you have Lyme, which is releasing these biotoxins. Yes, you may actually kill the organism if that's even possible. Um, you may or immobilize and destroy the organism, get rid of it from the body, but you're still left with this immune defect where you cannot export the toxins which are produced by the organism out of the cell, out of the body. And so you end up with this residual innate in inflammatory response. Is that an accurate way of looking at it? Yeah, in theory, that would be, yeah, that would be a, a hypothetical situation in practice, I would say exposure to mycotoxins is so common that I, I, I would say it's almost, you know, when you're looking at, for instance, someone who you've done the, the treatment with antibiotics or, or whatever, and a really common reason that someone's been to a Lyme literate doctor and done the antibiotics and hasn't worked is that they've got mold exposure, firstly. Right. So that's, that's a super common reason. Uh, I don't find it it's so much the other way around that if they've got Lyme, they won't respond to mold treatment. I find they will respond, but they'll only get to a certain stage and then you'll need to start addressing the Lyme in co-infections. Now, if you've done that, like let's say someone, you've done the mold treatment first and then you treat the Lyme and co-infections and then you find that they're, there's still a little way to go. They're still not totally better. There's a whole whole bunch of reasons that could be it could be responsible for that in my view. There could be heavy metals, there could be SIBO, uh, there could be some nutritional deficiencies, there could still be, still be some mold exposure. But yeah, let's throw that in there as a possibility. Maybe they still have Lyme biotoxins in there. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how to prove or disprove that that occurs in some cases. Right. So I think I think that's fair enough to have that in the, the list of possibilities. But then it should really be that some of the basic things like the cholestyramine or similar binders. And by the way, cholestyramine, I've gone away from using cholestyramine to a large extent because it's so, so harsh on the gut. So generally, well collar colocevalam I find very useful in combination with natural binders. I mean, in some cases, just particularly if they're mast cell activation um, patients, then just natural binders on their own will slowly and surely start um, taking those biotoxins out of the system. Yeah, interesting. That that's a that's a good segue into the treatment. So, I mean, in your course, this has been laid out by Shoemaker. You've made reference to the mm -hmm. classical CIRS treatment. There's I don't think you necessarily need to go through every single step. It's been covered ad nauseum. There's lots of information online. I'll, I'll include it in the notes. But for those who understand, who, who don't know, there are several steps involved in it. First is like, uh, okay, reducing exposure or, or getting out of the environment if possible, right? So that's that's pretty key if they can do it. But then there's also the binding, which is using, like you're talking about, you can use natural binders like uh, charcoal or um, a Kytazan mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you speak about those in a second, but then, um, but then there's all these steps, which are like correcting the hormone imbalance, correcting ACTH, mm -hmm. correcting VIP. That's generally the, uh, around the last step or something like that. And, and, um, and it, from what I understand in the way that you've portrayed it is it was very strict, although there's been many variations. A lot of the doctors mm -hmm. like yourself have actually been trying lots of different things and finding, well, that strict approach doesn't necessarily work. And I'd say just on behalf of my listeners, similar for, for myself, when I originally came across this information and to see how strict the therapy was, it can be quite daunting because if someone can't access a doctor of that kind, um, then, then they kind of feel, well, there's no hope. There's nothing they can do. Yeah. And this brings me to a question, which is if you are an individual, say hypothetically, there is a person who is pretty certain that they have this problem. They don't necessarily have access to all of the pharmaceutical interventions that are laid out in that kind of protocol. Mm -hmm. Of course, maybe best case scenario would be that they save as much money as they can and they find a doctor, even if they have to travel. But ultimately, what would be your advice for someone who doesn't have those resources, who can't get access to things like CSM, who can't get access to intranasal VIP? You know, what would be the best mode of action 
for that person to start off with trying to do? You know, what's the lowest hanging fruit? What do they need to prioritize? They need to prioritize getting away from the mold, 100%. That's for, if you've done that, that's that's 50% or more of the journey right there. Uh, that's absolutely the key. Uh, and it's and that's not an easy one. You know, in some, st- in some situations, that means it may mean moving. It may mean expensive remediation. I've known people who are living in a tent in their backyard for certain periods of time, which is not easy, I know. But... Um, if that's if if all of a sudden that's you've realized that's the major thing and living in a tent leads you to have no symptoms from being absolutely debilitated, I would say then it's probably worth it for a period of time, yeah. you know, to do that. And you've just got to you've just got to find a way to get away from it, and that's the key. Then whatever binders you can get your hands on, whether it be charcoal, whether it be bentonite clay, whether it be zeolite, they all do have an effect. You don't have to use pharmaceutical binders. They do seem to be a little bit more strong in certain cases, but you know, the way there's also been a, uh, you know, a precision approach, uh, which has been developed by Neil Nathan in, in concert with Emily Givler and, and Beth O'Hara, mm. uh, which are also, you know, who are also related to that Bob Miller group, um, nutrigenomic analysis. And they um, basically have looked at specific mycotoxins and which specific binders seem to address them. So if you can get some testing done, for instance, urinary mycotoxin or serum mycotoxin testing to find out which mycotoxins appear to be affecting you, then you can select natural binders based on on those. And that that's also a reasonable approach. Right. And, and, and so... Yeah, excellent point. If they can get a, get out of the environment, that's that's key. But that leads me to another question from uh, someone else who was asking: In the event that someone were to simply get out of the moldy environment and not necessarily do anything else, maybe the uh, you know healthy diet, they're trying to work on their nutrition, mm-hmm. lifestyle stuff. Uh, do you think that there's a possibility that they would recover fully? even if they don't do the full kind of CIRS treatment uh, modalities, let's say, uh, just through the main intervention being that they're not, they've not got any on- ongoing exposure, at least any significant ongoing exposure from the household. Yes, I think there's a possibility for sure. And that's what, you know, the group of what we call extreme mold avoiders, that's the, the basic premise behind their system, is that essentially... You've just got to get away from it. And often they're recommending living in a caravan or RV that's been gutted and then you've basically got no source of, no possible source of mold exposure there and uh, and getting away from all residential um, buildings, um, which, you know, I, and I understand that because there's so many, so many homes in the Western world are mold affected. I've known, I've known someone who said that they had gone and looked at a, a rental home every week for the last year. So basically 52 or more homes and had not found one which was suitable. So it, I have had a few patients do that who basically stopped living in a, in, in a home in totally and lived in a tent for a little while or lived in a, a caravan or RV. And it did help. But I generally found that they needed some treatment as well. Okay. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't exclude the possibility that, you know, getting – some people just going, getting away from the mold may give them total resolution. They probably don't come to me if that happens. So I, I wouldn't see them. That makes a lot of sense, right? It makes a lot of sense. And it's not the impression that I've been given, especially when you read some of the, let's say, mold literate doctors or the work mm-hmm. by some people. They would they take a very hard line stance on it. And I think that's mm-hmm. understandable because uh, when you're dealing with such a significant situation, if there's any possibility that you can get treatment, which has been shown to work, it's like, yeah, you must get this treatment. However, it also, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of people, as you know, who just simply cannot afford it. You know, they just can't afford to see a doctor. They can't afford even basic supplements because they've been so debilitated and maybe they're in an unfortunate position. They don't have family help or anything like that. And they're basically bed bound. So these people Mm -hmm. cannot... They, they just can't 
manage to do those even most basic treatments other than mm -hmm. getting out of the environment. But again, it makes sense that the body does have uh, its own intelligence, right? It can right. make the best out of really bad situations. And I think I have faith in the concept that it can readdress or it can rebalance things if enough time and the right environmental conditions are present. I think um, I'm not ruling out that there, there's people that can't do that, but I, I would imagine that I'd, I'd like to hope that it's possible. But okay then. So yeah, I think particularly if you don't have a significant amount of colonization in your body of the mold itself, it's going to be much more likely that your body can heal. Okay. Yeah. Interesting differentiating factor, because like you said, if their body becomes a, mo a sick building, you know, water damaged building, then it's like yeah. no matter where you go. And maybe that, I guess maybe that's something that you've seen in that one of the ways you mentioned this mold sabbatical and that some people leave their house and then they feel better, but then other people they leave and they don't notice any difference. You, mm. you think that the mold colonization might account for some of those differences? Yes, I think absolutely. Obviously, the other thing is if you, you're taking contaminated possessions with you, it's a, that's a common um, common, common trap as well. That's another one which I get asked about a lot and which I'd like you to discuss. How important is doing that? If someone has clothes, if they have tapestry, if they have anything which is porous and which can hold mycotoxins or spores, um, what? Yeah, how important is getting rid of possessions? So the porous possessions, look, the clothes, as far as we know, if there's no visible mold on them, uh, then generally washing them should should be a, because the because of the nature of clothes and washing being able to really get all the way through that should be able to to do it uh and and your clothes should be able to be salvaged so if you're going to go on a mold sabbatical just freshly washing your clothes and it can just be with normal detergent or it can be with borax right uh, borax is also a very useful compound uh now the problem is if you have a sofa uh, or a lounge suite, or a mattress, there's no way that you can get that same effect as like putting it in a washing machine and drying it. It's just you, there's just no way that we know of. Look, there are some there are some methods which are probably worthy of further um, research. So gamma irradiation is one of them. Mm. Um, sand blasting is another one. So there are some possibilities, but so far. Uh, in terms of the greater group of, of um, mold inspectors and remediators, uh, they have not found any method that's reliable to be able to, to remediate those items. So if you've had a significantly water damaged building and you're getting out of it and going to another residence that you know is clean, you need to get rid of your mattresses and lounge suites if they're, you know, cloth and or porous in any way. So if they're if they're like a made of a hard wood, then that should be able to. So anything that's made of hard wood, plastic, metal, that's non-porous, and that simply needs to be damp wiped and vacuumed, and that can generally be salvaged. Okay, okay. except in the most extreme of cases. So there may be some cases around where that's just not enough, and they need to even. Uh, they need to even dispose of the non-porous items. I'm not excluding that that may be the case sometimes, but in the vast majority of cases, you can hang on to those. How about books? Books can be yeah, can be scanned uh, or gamma irradiated. <laughs> I remember a story. That's what I've I... done with my. That's what I've done with my medical books because you know how hard it is to get yeah. medical books. No, of course. I remember listening to Jill Carnahan uh, giving her story. I think, I, I believe it was her who figured out that this was a problem for herself and she re re recounted having to basically get rid of all of these books that she'd been holding, you know, medical books and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was her. It was definitely someone in this community and, and kind of just saying how it was completely necessary because um, whenever she was in contact with them or whoever it was, was in contact with the books, um, the symptoms would come back. And so it was like, 
yeah, a difficult thing. People need to make sacrifices. But when you're dealing with someone whose life has basically been destroyed, which, as you know, most of these patients are in this situation, they cannot function, they cannot work, they cannot do the most basic things that we all take for granted, then it's like yeah, getting rid of material possessions. I think so many people are willing to do it simply because they've lost their entire life you know they've lost their ability to exist in any normal way so uh in the big scheme of things it's it's a small fish um but so just to summarize for people right for the audience because we've covered so much uh, already you know this this concept of cirs is that you know there are certain amounts of people and correct if anything this is just what i'm understanding from what i've read before and what you've said today there are a certain por portion of the population for whatever reason, whether it be genetic or uh, mm -hmm. whichever combination of genes that may allow this to manifest or prior infection or mold exposure or whatever, mm -hmm. these people have a difficulty getting rid of biotoxins and they can be from organisms, but mostly they're going to be from mold. And this is really common because many, uh, m many buildings because of various practices and construction and whatnot are not up upheld in the way that they should be. And so we all have this ongoing exposure to mycotoxins. Um, and there are certain people who just cannot get rid of them. And so eventually what this does is it is triggering a part of the immune system, which is unable to effectively communicate to the rest of the immune system or another part called the adaptive immune system, getting this stuff out of the body, tagging it and basically tagging it with it, generating antibodies and clearing it out. So this person begins to accumulate these mycotoxins, which are causing or, or triggering this, this relentless and progressive inflammatory response, which is eventually like leading to central nervous system inflammation, vascular inflammation, systemic inflammation, which is very difficult to pick up on tests. And it is potentially implicated in a lot of these complex diseases or complex conditions, which seem to be more common these days, or at least the diagnosis has been. This ranges from MCAS, this ranges from multiple chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. It accounts for a wide variety of diagnoses in the way that one might be able to tell if they've got this condition is by looking at their symptoms. If they've got symptoms which are relegated to one system in the body, for instance, if they have IBS and constipation and then acid reflux, but they don't have any other symptoms, it's not likely that they have CIRS. But on the other hand, if they have IBS, yet at the same time, they get severe migraines, they get neuropathy and they have chronic fatigue. They're basically, you know, having to sleep 12, 13 hours a night, or they have relent relenting in, in insomnia, chances are they they are a better candidate for fitting the diagnostic criteria of this condition. And um and to to the 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 best way to go about addressing it, first of all, I mean there are tests that you can do. There is this visual contrast sensitivity test, the neuroquant like you mentioned, the blood tests. Um, ultimately, the first point of call is reducing the exposure, removing yourself from the ongoing exposure to give the body a break, enhancing the way that the body is clearing this through using binders and whatnot. Like you've mentioned, there are some natural binders. There's also pharmaceutical binders. And then there is a protocol to try and address some of the hormonal imbalances and things. Would you say that that's a fair summary of what we're looking at here? That's a brilliant summary. Thanks, Elliot. This is super common. This is not something that's just happening to you know one in a million of people or anything like that dr scott mcmahon who, who worked closely with dr shoemaker was uh, estimating around you know somewhere around 11 to 13 percent of the population that's that's one around one in seven is actually suffering not just talking about the susceptibility this is actually who's got it right. um dr nathan was saying the numbers in, in america are probably you know it can be measured in the millions most likely and so it's extremely common. And so some of the things to know, like we've mentioned already, if you, you haven't responded to basic functional medicine protocols, or you've got a multi-system illness, like we've talked about, or you've, you've had some known exposure to water damage buildings and you're unwell, all of those things would lead you to highly suspect that you've got some type of mold related illness. So it may be CRS or it could be another type. But just, I, I think that's a really important take home point that this is super common. Um, I think every doctor, every general practitioner is seeing this every day. They just don't know about it.
And uh, I, it's really my greatest wish that the awareness of, of mold-related problems and other related things like EMF and stealth infection start getting into the, the more conventional medical world so that less people are suffering. That's ultimately what we are trying to, to get to here is reduce suffering. So that leads us into a couple of questions I had. So you, uh, many of the listeners are probably familiar with Dr. Neil Nathan's uh, work and the book Toxic, like you mentioned. Um, you had had him on a couple years ago. He had been in contact with a researcher, I believe he's an MD himself, Dr. Robert Navio. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And he had, based on his research and based on his collation of the data, which is really a pretty groundbreaking concept, I believe, to understand what is going on, at least at the cellular level or systems wide, how this fits in with CIRS, because w- what you've been discussing is you, you, you have the hormonal changes, you have the immune system changes, and these are all kind of like higher level mechanisms. But I think that this concept laid out by Navio referred to as the cell danger response, I think that this really can help to hit hits the nail. My understanding is the cell danger response refers to a set of primitive, uh, primitive responses that the cell undertakes in response to various threats. Now, my understanding is the threats can be and uh, and after a certain period of time should. However, if the cell is not able to recover from, from this threat, it may go into this response on a more chronic um, basis. Now, that that's a that's my understanding. So there's there is there's it's been broken down further into CDR one, CDR two, and CDR three, different stages uh, of of that um, process. And uh, so CDR one is more general inflammation, is my recollection, while CDR three is more autoimmune. And I have some thoughts about how that can relate to CIRS. So it may well be that that. The CIRS is a form of a cell danger response. It's one form, and it, it's particularly how the cell danger response um, manifests in reaction to biotoxins. That's that's basically my suspicion. Why does that matter, or why does the concept of the cell danger response matter? Well, one possible, I mean, one thing to be aware of is that the the wrong interventions, even though, for instance, treating a certain part of the response, let's say you gave the example of mitochondrial supplements. If you do that at the wrong time, it may be harmful rather than helpful. Giving thiamine at the wrong time may be harmful rather than helpful. So so that's probably one, one important um, point that comes up and 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 I guess that that this concept raises awareness of. And the other concept, which also Dr. Nathan talks a lot about, is the to a degree. But the question is, okay, how can we reboot the system? And probably for me, where this understanding has taken me is to understand that brain retraining is very important. So the use of of modalities such as the Gupta program and DNRS. Um, now there's one called Primal Trust. Um, there's various other um, methodologies because it appears that part of the issue, and this wasn't part of the original research, it's more recently been um, realized and discovered, is that part of the problem is that the brain becomes sensitized um, to the original toxin. Mm-hmm. And as Ashok Gupta points out, um, and I do recommend having a look at his website, which is the theguptaprogram.com, is that after that that original toxic insult, the brain, and he says it's the amygdala and the insular regions of the brain, become sensitized and essentially start um, acting in a loop where the, the they become more activated and that activation further sensitizes them mm-hmm. and you're, you're stuck in a vicious loop until you undergo the kind of treatment that can desensitize things. And so his program and DNRS are designed specifically to do that, to take people out of the vicious limbic loop. Right. Um, I do want to 
ask you something else about that in just a second, but just yep. to come back, because that's fascinating, but just to come back mm-hmm. to this concept of the, the cell danger response, um, you mentioned how, I mean, like, so a typical functional medicine workup would be to, like you said, look for the biochemical defects, which is so much better than the conventional medical approach to chronic disease, as everyone acknowledges or anyone looking at it objectively can acknowledge. However, a lot of the times it would seem, like you said, is that a lot of the biochemical defects are approached reductionistically. So for instance, you mentioned low methylation. If someone has markers of poor methylation, the answer is just to give them methyl donors or give them some kind of a methylation supplement to address that cause or address the biochemical defect without necessarily looking at the root cause because what I found so fascinating and frankly revolutionary about Navio's concepts were that in the initial phases of the cell danger response, the cell is basically um, sensing its environment is, is detecting some kind of a threat, right? And part of the response to say a pathogenic infection is to intentionally turn down methylation intentionally that's a very intentional concept likewise he he spoke about and you mentioned you were talking about this on on your course um this concept that the mitochondria can shift between multiple states so you have like m1 m2 and m0 and one of those states uh, during this initial phase of this in flat or this Um, this cell danger response is the mitochondria go from uh, prime to generate ATP in the form of energy to becoming prime to generate reactive oxygen species, as in um, as a way to protect against like a cellular infection or something like that. So it's like you have all of these adaptations, which you view from a functional medicine standpoint as, oh, they've got mitochondrial dysfunction. Oh, they've got high lactate. Oh, they've got low methylation. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pinpoint and treat each of those different ones with 10 different supplements. It's yeah. not taking that broader systems biology approach, which is saying, OK, why is the cell doing this? And in the context of like what you're discussing, if someone has this threat of a continual exposure to biotoxins or the cell is consistently sensing biotoxins in its immediate environment, then it's almost like it's using its intelligence to revert back to a a very primitive kind of state, which occurs during any kind of like acute infection or whatever. And it's like, okay, I'm going to switch off all of these functions so that Mm. I don't enhance the infection. And part of this is going to be a way to protect against the infection. And then, like you said, there's different stages. And so one of the next stages is actually starting to repair tissue. So that's like proliferation and cell building and tissue repair, et cetera. But again, if someone gets stuck in these phases for whatever reason, then that can be problematic. And I just wonder whether you have noticed, because it's something that I certainly 100% have noticed clinically, is that using supplements, say if you do testing and you identify that someone does have mitochondrial dysfunction, using the supplements which would ordinarily uh, resolve that, say you use typical mitochondrial-based approaches, therapies like L-carnitine, creatine, Mm -hmm. coenzyme Q10, thiamine, the other B vitamins, whilst on paper that should mechanistically help them because they have clear impairments in the way that their mitochondria are metabolizing nutrients, Uh, actually it makes them feel worse. And it's not just temporary. In fact, it can make them feel significantly worse. That's what I've personally found. I'm just wondering if you found anything similar. Absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, I definitely find that giving methylation supplements at the wrong time in treatment uh, can can be harmful. And uh, yeah, there's a number of things. I found, for instance, if you try to treat someone's gut at the start of the CIRS, too early, you're not going to have good results. Uh, if you try and treat the mitochondria too early, so there's a, there's there's a whole there's a, there's a whole order of treatment that's very important, I think. And um, I think generally the original research team had a lot of it right in that definitely you want to you want to get away from the mold as early as possible. You want to get binders in there. I mean, there's other things I didn't think of, for instance, giving herbs to just get the bile going. Like that's super important. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and you know, in some cases using some antioxidants is, is super important. 
but you got to do all of that. And, you know, but rather than trying to artificially lower the inflammation, I have found that more going after the stealth infections mm -hmm. is more the key. So rather than worrying about all the, particularly the steps of the CRS protocol, where they use Losartan to lower TGF beta one, and he uses erythropoietin to lower C4A and some other bits and pieces like, um, uh, Pia glitter zone to lower the MMP nine and so on, rather than worrying about those things. I think the key is, and Dr. Raj Patel really was one of the influences for me in this area. He said, well, really you can scrap all of that, the middle steps and really just focus on getting rid of any other sources of inflammation in the system. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, treating the stealth infections, treating SIBO, um, looking at lowering EMF, all of those things are going to be quite important. Looking for heavy metals, et cetera, rather than, rather than using medications to try and artificially lower um, inflammation. So I'd say that's probably one of the biggest ways in which the protocol has changed. And um, But overall, I still think that, that the, the basics that they had down of the treatment order are quite good in general, like, you know, like starting off with getting away from exposure and binders and then right. finishing off with VIP nasal spray, which I do still find is quite important. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you said that because, uh, again, it makes sense that if you reduce or you, you deal with the cause of the inflammation, like the trigger of that cell danger response or whatever it is, then the immune system will likely stop making elevated amounts of TGF beta, for instance, it will start making what it needs to in the right amounts if the triggers is done. But then here's the question is that like you mentioned, if someone let's say you take someone through a CIRS protocol, and you are almost certain that they no longer have the exposure, they no longer have these underlying triggers of inflammation. And yet they are still stuck in this kind of rut this brain-based, uh, maybe it's central sensitization or maybe it's like a hypersensitivity or like you said, the brain becomes sensitized to these loops. And that that was an interesting uh, thing in, in some of uh, Navio's more recent papers where he's also discussing the connection between the vagus nerve. And I know that you and Neil Nathan have spoken about this. You also talk about this on your course and this relates to that brain retraining aspect of things. So for instance, um, what is it? So, so, so the brain becomes hyper, like hypersensitized to any potential inflammatory uh, stimulus, and what would happen? It would, it would kind of maintain. Is this occurring through the vagus nerve? Is this occurring through the autonomic nervous system? Is how, how, uh, in a simple way, how, how could this be explained? Well, the simple way that um, a shock. Uh, has explained it. So Ashok Gupta is my namesake. He's a psychologist out in your your way in London, I think. And uh, he he's done a lot of work on this. And I, I like he's got quite a good model on his website if you look at it. But he says really the problem originates in the amygdala and insula. So the amygdala is the fire alarm of the brain. So you can think of a simple analogy is the fire alarm in your house. You want it to go off when there's actually a fire, right? And what you don't want the the fire alarm to do is just go off every time you put a bit of toast in your toaster, which hopefully is gluten-free. Um, <laughs> um, so what happens? So you can imagine the situation where you have a fire alarm which has a bit of a mind of its own. One day you have a small fire, you put it out, but then from then on, the, your alarm says, okay, I'm going to be super vigilant here. I'm just going to turn up my sensitivity myself. And um, anything that even res resembles a fire, um, even for a tiny second, um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to set off and, and start beeping. Well, you could imagine that's going to be, you know, so every time you put anything in the toaster, anytime you put something on the stove, anytime you put something on the oven, maybe even anytime you turn on the heater, mm -hmm. your alarm's going off. And so what you've got to do is go and say, well, sorry, buddy, I know you've got a mind of your own, but we're just going to have to turn the sensitivity right down because the purpose of you being here is, is simply to warn us of a fire. Mm -hmm. um, not of, not of the fact that I'm just cooking some food. So 
that's the that's kind of an analogy or, or a way of thinking about it. I don't know if you like that, but um, yeah, it's excellent. <laughs> And so, so what happens is the brain is basically um, directed towards survival. Now, if you've had a major mold uh, episode, basically the brain will then pick up on even tiny amounts of mold mm. and start setting off the alarm, which then sets off more inflammation. So that may well be the reason that many, many mold patients start reacting to even a tiny speck of mold yeah. where their family members may be looking at them going, what are you kidding? This place is totally clean. And it's like, well, no, there's a tidy speck over here. And really, you know, that you've got to get to the stage where a tiny little bit of exposure is not going to get you back to, to square one again, and really just, um, trigger a massive inflammatory response. So that's where the brain training piece comes in in that, you know, it's, I call it reassurance therapy partly because it's reassuring the brain that it's not in danger. We're not in danger anymore. We're away from this mold. Now we're in the recovery process. Mm -hmm. And you could say that's the, the simplest form of, of brain retraining is just starting to reassure yourself um, regularly that you're not in any danger and having like a little mantra. That's the, that's the simplest form of it. Now, these other systems have taken it to a, a much more um, sophisticated level where you've got various meditations and so on. But whichever way you do it, whichever program you use, you have to be quite committed to it. And that is going to um, address a very important part of this process. Yeah, it's it's really interesting um, what you're saying there. there, there uh, you've spoken about things which enhance the vagus nerve. So our listeners, mm -hmm. if they follow me, they'll have a good idea of what the vagus nerve is. But but layering the the work of Stephen Porges and and his polyvagal theory and things like that, that's where it gets super interesting. But uh, just uh, is it correct? Would you say it's accurate to say that doing things which can enhance vagus nerve stimulation um, can help the body to re-entrain into this? let's say, less hypervigilant state? Is that part of the mechanism? Because I know you mentioned the amygdala and the insula. It's interesting how this ties in with PTSD or childhood trauma um, and how yes. this, perhaps a similar process is occurring where basically these yes. people are hypersensitive to any environmental change. Um, but the I know that Neil Nathan has spoken a lot about this as part of potentially one of the ways to um to calm down or to to normalize that cell danger response to get out of it to reboot the system like you're saying part of that is through things which um aside from the brain retraining is things like uh vagal nerve stimulation so you've mentioned like gargling and and other things yes. like that deep breathing but you also yes. on your course you mentioned some supplements and things which are naturally cholinergic one being hupazine a Another one yep. being uh, nicotine, galantamine, I believe. Maybe not. Yeah. But I wonder, yep. is is oh, that? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. So, so basically, once your amygdala is activated, it activates the sympathetic part of your autonomic nervous system to create like a um, uh, a hyper arousal response to your body. You, it puts you in fight or flight. Now, one of the major parts of our body that balances this kind of response is the vagus nerve it's kind of the major part of the parasympathetic or rest and rebuild part of the nervous system now that seems to often get down regulated in chronic illness and so if you can upregulate it through you know there's a variety of practices there's also some vagal nerve stimulators you can um, actually purchase and um, but having some kind of strategy there, I do think enhances the whole process. And, you know, for me, I just do, you know, I tend to do gargling regularly mm -hmm. and, um, and humming is also very useful. So if you, you think of actually, you know, the, the Buddhist kind of um, chanting, that's kind of, when you think about it, that, that probably is a big way of why they're getting into such a deep meditative state mm -hmm. is they're actually activating, uh, activating the vagus nerve. And getting into getting into these really deep meditate that's probably enabling the process of deep meditation as well. And so there's probably a bi-directional effect. So meditation is is likely to be very, very useful because you're it's allowing your body to get into a deep parasympathetic 
uh, response. Now, it may be that your body has to calm down a certain amount before you can even undertake meditation. So um, you may have to use, like if you're feeling very anxious, you may have to use some supplements and and so on just to downregulate the level of, of anxiety and maybe do some other practices such as yoga nidra. That can be very useful because that's also about lying down and progressively relaxing uh, each part of the body, uh, getting into those deep relaxation states, and then doing meditation after that. So having it like having a getting into a bit of a schedule of your day um, can be very useful. I, I do think yoga can be uh, a very useful part of this recovery. Having having a bit of a, a yoga practice. Okay. Okay, I've been thinking about this this a lot because, uh, as I said to you I've, uh, before the call, uh, th- there are people on my group, most of my followers follow me because of my work on uh, thiamine, right? Uh, using it right. clinically. And um, I have seen not a small amount of, of people, part of my group and my wider network and followers who have found that uh, thiamine in medicinal doses in the right form has been uh, somewhat of a game changer. They may have seen a lot of progress in terms of getting out of mold, dealing with Lyme, um, but they appear to be stuck in this hypersensitized state. And it's so bad in some cases, uh, when I used to work directly with clients, I would see some people who, and I'm not sure if you've seen this, I know other practitioners have, there are some people who are so sensitive and I couldn't understand this from a purely like physiological perspective, let's say, who are so sensitive that one single drop, like you get a liquid f- form of a, a supplement, any kind of supplement, a herb, anything like that. And one single drop, which is maybe even been diluted, not succus, so it's not homeop- homeopathic or anything, but it's been diluted by like 10 times. And they have one drop of the diluted amount and it sends their system like crazy. They, they notice changes yeah, yeah. and it, it seems that, I mean, that there's no way, I don't think you could necessarily explain that biochemically, although I do believe that you might be able to explain that uh, from the perspective of what you're saying, that the brain yeah. and the, therefore the rest of the body is sensing any foreign material, any foreign element, which could potentially be considered a threat. And by taking just a minute, minute, amount of some kind of a supplement or a herb or anything that they're not that's basically not food sends their system you know into like crazy mode for several days and these people are so sensitive so i think these are the kind of patients that really really would benefit from this kind of thing not to say that the others wouldn't but i feel as though there's no way to work with people if their nervous system is so sensitive unless you unless you do something like this um but sorry, back onto the topic, I'd noticed a lot of people were using B1 and they would find that that was like the final thing, you know, the final thing that kind of brought them out of this state of hyper arousal, hypersensitivity and renormalize. That's not to say it's the only thing because they'd done a lot of work prior, but it was only when they'd taken B1, usually in the form of benfotiamine or TTFD, that it's like, okay, things finally started working again as they should. So I, I've been interested in the mechanism of that and trying to put that in the context of like cell danger response. And maybe it's the case that actually they're in a, in a state where they can benefit from mitochondrial repletion therapies and things. Or I wonder, um, and this is a topic for another discussion, but ultimately what we do know about thiamine is that they have used it. A lot of the early research was using it to directly stimulate the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve being basically primarily using acetylcholine. Now, one of the things that they discovered very early on was that one of the first things that would happen in a thiamine deficiency was you would lose the ability to make acetylcholine and the action of acetylcholine at the synapse was no longer effective. So there is this like tight relationship between uh, thiamine, acetylcholine, cholinergic neuron function, and the vagus nerve. I, I am under the impression from what I've, the research that I've read anyway, is that I, I don't, I think it would be fair to say that thiamine is perhaps the most important B vitamin for the vagus nerve uh, in that it is so central to that cholinergic communication from the brain to the rest of the body through the autonomic network. And what you're saying about the vagus nerve being really important for basically counteracting this hypervigilance and uh, re rebalancing the system kind of thing, rebooting. I wonder whether um, rather than thiamine merely being a mitochondrial 
uh, supporter, which we know it is, I wonder whether it's actually something to do with 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 kind of rebalancing the Vegas nerve. I'm not sure, um, but yeah, th- 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 I could talk about that for hours. So that's 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 off topic. Um, okay. Anything, do you have just a couple of minutes? Uh, I have a few questions from uh, my followers and most of them I've asked, I've like dotted in between, Um, but there are a couple things which I haven't um, asked and uh, would you be willing to answer those? Sure, why not? Thank you, I appreciate it. They will also appreciate it. Okay, so um, first of all, I think this has been answered. Someone asked, okay, they have chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic gut issues. Is it still possible to suspect mold as the main etiology when you were exposed 20 years ago and didn't develop any symptoms in the years that followed? Um, And today you don't necessarily have typical symptoms such as sinuses, asthma, or cough. Well, they're thinking mold colonization, right? They're not thinking SIRS. I think you've answered this question. Is it correct to say that someone could, if there was a trigger later on, if they had mycotoxins in the body, let's say, or, or whatever, do you think it's possible 20 years ago? Yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, one other thing that um, has been brought to my attention that the original research team looked at is that you may have a certain genetic type, but those genes may not be activated yet. And so it is possible to have the HLA genetics and be living in a water damage building, but you're not reactive. But then maybe you got a certain infection. Now, what was described was like glandular fever, Coxsackie virus, Lyme disease, uh, Kawasaki. They were the main ones. But I'm almost 100% sure that COVID is going to be one of them. Right. So that could be that. That would be a reason, a really um, obvious scenario I could think of. So let's say you had mold exposure 20 years ago, then you got COVID. Uh, and maybe you did or didn't know about it, and then that's activated your HLA genes, mm-hmm. and then and now all of a sudden you're reacting to mold, and so whether you've got the mold in your body or whether it's in your external environment, it may well be if you've moved away from that residence that you've actually got the mold in your body, but now you're actually reacting to those mycotoxins. So that would be my explanation. Excellent points. It also possible for someone, let's say, uh, just something I'd add from what I understand of mm-hmm. this, is that if they lived 20 years ago in a moldy house and didn't have symptoms, like you said, they may not have been expressing those HLA sequences, yeah. They may be living in an environment which does have mold and they just can't see it because sometimes it's not visible to the naked eye. And so they may think they don't have a problem with mold because they didn't have it back. They didn't have a problem back then. But let's say, like you said, they've had an infection since then. There's this underlying kind of inflammatory environment. And for, for whatever reason, their genes have been expressed. Now they may be, uh, responding to something in their, in their current environment, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, one possibility is, for instance, taking contaminated furniture with you to the next residence. That's a, that's a possibility for sure. So there's a few different possibilities that needed to be unpacked there. But yes, let me just say, it, it may well not be always that the the timing matches up. Like, for instance, I moved into the water damage building and I developed the symptoms there. There is a number of reasons that the timing may not match up. Okay, perfect. Um, someone asked... If you do nothing, how long does it take for the body to detect, detox a mold, moderate slash heavy case of mold toxicity? I think you've covered this already, but um, yeah, how? Let's say if someone did nothing, like the only thing that they did, like you said, that that what the the never molders or something. I can't remember what you called them, but the people extreme mold avoidance, extreme mold avoidance. Okay, say you take that approach. How long do you think it might take for the system to reboot or rebalance if it does? Um, I think it's pretty hypothetical, but let's say I would guess it would be somewhere around the one year mark okay. to 18 month mark. I mean, that's already how long I find it takes people to totally recover, even with moving out and getting treatment. Okay. So if they've got a particularly robust system, which is able to just kick in and excrete the mycotoxins, et cetera, and get the inflammatory process cleared out. Um, on their own, I would suspect it should take the same amount of time, but it's, you know, look, it's a little bit speculative. 
Okay. Another one about citrate-based supplements. So there's information mm-hmm. that some of the citrate-based supplements are uh, made via, I think it's aspergillus or some other yeah. kind of mold. Uh, do you find that mold patients react to those supplements? I have definitely heard of this being talked about in forums. I myself have not necessarily seen it that often that they react. Now, I use the citrate form of minerals um, for when they have oxalate toxicity. Yeah. So the cit- And the reason is the citrate part itself is also helps with the excretion of and binding of oxalates. So rather than just using magnesium as glycinate or something like that, you use the magnesium citrate and you'd use calcium citrate and you mm. use zinc citrate. Yeah. And so I haven't had a lot of trouble with those supplements, but occasionally someone will react to them. I don't think the fact that they're produced by the fungus necessarily means that they're going to be reacted to. Because if they don't actually contain any of the organism itself, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because by that same thinking, then uh, vegetable enzymes generally come from aspergillus. And I haven't heard of of people reacting to those. So as far as I'm aware, the fact that it's produced by that, well, then you'd say all mold patients would react to penicillin, right? Because that comes from from mold as well. So I don't think that's 100% the case. So it's worth, I think it's worth considering the possibility that you could be reacting to citrates if you're not doing well on a program. But in general, it's not that common as far as I've found. No, yeah, there could be other reasons why someone's reacting and they might just be blaming it on mold, which is understandable. But at the same time, if you isolate a substance, I'm in agreement with you. If you isolate a substance, generally, most, if not all supplement companies, I mean, I run a supplement company. I know that we have to have every single batch tested for mold, mold spores, mycotoxins, these kind of things. So generally, if you making a supplement, you, you if it's manufactured in a laboratory and it's isolated in the correct way, then there's going to be very little chance that there's any mycotoxin or mold Mm. now there could be something maybe i guess on like due to the molecular configuration maybe there is a way that the body is sensing in some via yeah biophysics or something like that but i don't think chemically it would necessarily contain anything but who knows okay uh similar question uh vitamin c supplements which are derived from mold are they um, do you know anything about that? And or is it a similar concept to the to what we were just talking about? I don't. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there are any vitamin C supplements which are derived from mold. I think people sometimes get citrate and vitamin yeah. C confused. I think okay. uh, generally, generally, yeah, vitamin C will come from you know things like sago plum and and so on, okay. and um, and you can also get synthetic ascorbic acid, of course. Okay. So so I, as far as I'm aware, vitamin C does not come from um, from mold and so on. The, the one thing about vitamin C to be aware of is if you've got high oxalates, you want to be on a maximum of 500 milligrams of vitamin C a day, unless you're adding in quite a bit of glutathione, right? Uh, which, which tends to keep it in the, um, in the reduced state and it doesn't go into oxalate so much then. Yeah. And that is something, uh, that does play out clinically. I mean, like, uh, the, the, the research is, there's, there's there's a group of you know physicians who will say no it's a myth that uh, vitamin C converts to oxalate in any high amount but actually there's also a bunch of research which says the opposite and I've yeah. just seen hundreds of people who would come to me specifically for oxalate that's a stuff that I mm-hmm. I also have spoken about in the past and um and and these people categorically do develop the symptoms from taking high dose vitamin C. It's, it's undisputable. It's not for every, not everyone, but yeah, it's, it's true. Okay. Um, another one was the, okay. What is first SIBO or CIRS mold toxicity? Um, SIBO as per my experience is oftentimes a result or a symptom of Mm. autonomic nervous system dysfunction caused by the original cause of CIRS. But what do you think? Yeah, I can't exclude the possibility that it could go the other way sometimes, but I haven't seen it. I, yeah, The way I've seen it is, as you describe it, CIRS leads to an autonomic uh, instability. I think the other thing that happens is the mycotoxins in the bile actually change the microbiome mm. composition and, ch- and also change the motility Interesting. of the small intestine. Uh, so, you know, when you give VIP, that actually starts, you know, re 
you know, increasing the motility of the small intestine again. So a lack of VIP might be part of the problem and low MSH may be mm. part of the problem. So there's definitely a, a link when people have CRS that they then develop SIBO and oftentimes they won't be able to resolve their SIBO until right. they've at least dealt with the mycotoxins. Right. Well, yeah, uh, these are the kind of patients who might be reliant on antimicrobials or reliant on digestive enzymes, reliant on HCL, uh, when really they shouldn't be. It's like their digestion should work. But actually, if they don't take these things, then their gut just stops moving or they can't digest food or whatever. Uh, that's what I personally found anyway. And it's like SIBO, at least in those cases, doesn't seem to be the root cause. Um, but yeah, okay. Right. Uh... I do know that with patients with a lot of gut um, bacter bacterial endotoxins, they can actually develop a CRS-like condition as well. Interesting. So that probably, yeah. So, so that probably is the 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 scenario in which something like SIBO, where they have a high bacterial load, can give you a CRS-like situation. So I think that is possible. Right. So the endotoxin acting as the biotoxin in the, the yeah, body. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's, that's right. fascinating. So, that's fascinating. Yeah, uh, Kieran Krishnan from uh, Microbiome Labs did a very interesting presentation on this recently and I was uh, it just clicked to me hang saying hang on this is basically CRS. Yeah, wow. So it's I mean yeah, in that case Jesus, how many people have SIBO, you know? <laughs> <Whew. Yeah. laughs> yeah, okay. That might be one of the reasons why some people who do have SIBO, I mean a lot of I, I found a lot of people don't have systemic symptoms when they have SIBO, but then other people have severe systemic issues. Like they get body pain and they get brain fog and everything. And then when they, they address the gut issues, everything improves. And you could say, well, intestinal permeability and there's various mechanisms by which that happens. Yeah, but yeah, interesting, yeah. the endotoxin link with the bio... Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Okay. That's right, yeah. Um, and, and just one point on that. Apparently, avoiding coconut oil is important. Because of the when, high saturated um, fat content? Yeah, yeah. It makes the LPS into a, a more um, a more dangerous form of LPS. So at least until the until that um, bacterial endotoxemia has been settled, uh, avoiding those kind of high saturated fats appears to be important. Yeah, I think that's... I read a paper about that. It's like referred to as lipid rafts or something. It's like the, the saturated yeah. fat actually facilitates the entry of the endotoxin right through the intestinal... Even if there's not intestinal permeability, saturated fat in and of itself can carry en high amounts of endotoxin. Um, mm. And that's fascinating because, you know, many of the people on like the carnival diet or ketogenic diet to start it because because they think it's going to help them, there's a, a bunch of people who, who actually get worse and there's various reasons why that might be, but it could also be due to the saturated fat content. Yeah, that's right. I do think, I am thinking more and more that you need to get people's guts sorted out before going on keto and right. also having a look at, at your genes around apolipoprotein E. Right. It, it certainly doesn't seem to be the panacea that it was made out to be, uh, at least for a bunch of people. Um then again, it does have it does seem to have beneficial effects for others. So yeah. it's a minefield, Absolutely. isn't it? Okay. Um, yeah. another one. Does boron help with mold? Well, you mentioned borax, which is tetrahydroborate, I believe. Yep. yep. Um, yep. do you use is that the main form of? Uh, would would you use that internally or use that in baths or is that just to clean clothes? Well, that's mainly just for cleaning clothes. Also, carpet. Okay. If you've got contaminated carpet, you can use borax on it. Now, in terms of boron being used as a mineral, yes, it does. It does have an, an anti-inflammatory effect. And there's actually a couple of very interesting papers on boron which suggest that it would be most likely useful in CRS. Now, one interesting fact is some people with CRS get high sex-binding hormone globulin, mm -hmm. or SHBG. Uh, boron is one of the only things that helps to bring that down. And often as a result of that, they tend to develop low testosterone. So, and giving them testosterone is kind of futile in that situation. Mm -hmm. So boron, that's one particular situation where I use boron. Usually at a dose of around three, four milligrams a day. That's interesting. Have you found it to be effective in bringing down uh, SHBG? Well, it doesn't normalize it, but it does bring it down. Yeah. Okay. There, I mean, there's a there's another cause of that. I I, I discovered this by accident. Uh, I had suffered from high SHBG, like super high SHBG, for a long time for no identifiable reason. And I I don't have SIRS. I've done all the testing and everything like that. Um, so I was 
figuring out what it was, I came across some research. Um, it turns out that iron overload, I didn't know that I had her hereditary hemochromatosis. I don't have the classical genotype, but mm -hmm. I have like a mild mm -hmm. polymorphism in the C2A2Y. Okay. And, um, yeah. and it turns out there's there's been a, a group of studies which were looking at um, elevated uh, iron concentration in the liver and iron deposition, and they found it directly correlated with SHBG. And of course, uh, I had high total testosterone. I found this in several male clients as well, no females so far, and um, and low free testosterone. The only thing that I found to bring it down, uh, I didn't expect it would have any change on my SHBG, but when I brought down my iron saturation, it was up at like 60% at one point, and yeah. that's generally not good. When I brought down uh, iron saturation, SHBG came down in concert with it and it, it's gradually come down into normal levels and my free testosterone normalized uh so there's a couple of other people who've done that since and they find it works so that's something maybe you should try if you've got a male client who like nothing the yep. shbg isn't responding okay. iron overload could be one uh okay, okay another right. thing okay um most beneficial diet or way of eating if you see that someone's got cirs is there any specific protocol that you follow or is it Individual. Uh, well, so yeah, so it depends on, again, you can sort of subtype CRS, right? And we've talked about this a little bit. So if they're mast cell dominant, they need to look at um, avoiding histamine foods. If they're CRS with oxalates, then they need to cut out at least the highest oxalate foods. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's CRS with mold or candida, uh, then, you know, basically you want to avoid base any high sugar foods. And, you know, high carbohydrate grains, so gluten grains in general, you want to avoid um, and any foods that are known to have mycotoxins in them. So, so that includes the grains, that includes uh, many of the nuts as well, uh, particularly peanuts. So those are some of the things like similar to like the, the diet that had been advocated by, let me see. Um, name has just escaped me, but the, the, the fungal link, Doug Kaufman. Doug Kaufman has a has a diet which has got a phase one and a phase two, which is an basically an antifungal diet. Uh, those are, those would be the main things. There was one other piece, but I, I think I've lost it just now. Okay, okay, um, okay. Do you what do you think about methylene blue ingested or nebulized to help with mold illness? I assume that they might mean mold colonization, but also maybe CRS. Uh, anything you got any experience with methylene blue? Yeah, I do. I use methylene blue at higher doses for Bartonella infection, which is one of the Lyme co-infections. And so I often use up to 150 or even 200 milligrams a day. Wow. It is very effective for the persistent organism. So often after treating them with herbs for a couple of years, um, then hit them with methylene blue, sometimes in concert with disulfiram, uh, and, that can be very useful with just getting rid of all the persistent organisms of uh, Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia. And it seems to just get rid of some of the others as well, mm. even though that hasn't been described. So at that, that's one way of using it. Now, at a much lower dose, more like 1 to 10 milligrams, it is helpful for the mitochondria. Mm. It helps to provide the right um, substrate for the mitochondria. Now, there's one subgroup of people who can't tolerate it, and that's if they've got a genetic polymorphism around G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Mm. So it's, if, they're not, if people are not tolerating it, you might need to test for that. And, uh, and, it, and if so, you may not be able to tolerate it unless you build up your NAD levels and so on. But I think it's a very fascinating compound. I take a little bit myself, especially to just help boost um, brain function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so high dose for the antimicrobial effect, but low dose yep. for like mitochondrial support. Yeah, yep. okay. Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, are there any lights which are, uh, which are effective? So like UV lights, blue lights, um, infrared lights, anything to use on the mold that's growing in buildings or, um, or yeah. I'm not aware of the first one, uh, but for just for using on your body, certainly infrared's very helpful. It helps you to detoxify. So using an infrared sauna or light panel can be very, very useful to just start detoxifying. And then using something like a violite or other type of um, um, 
device that specifically delivers light to the brain is very useful if you've got a lot of neuroinflammation. Right. You can also get like a red light helmet. So red light in general is helpful. In general, you want to avoid blue light. So I'm, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, that trying uh, that trying to reduce the amount of blue light is very helpful for ma maximizing mitochondrial function because blue light can be like you know basically like a toxin. Yeah, I think um, I think the question was more along the lines of. Um like controlling mold in buildings, for instance. So, you know, they, they use like maybe UVC lights to, to oh, I see. like as an anti antibacterial, like a, a, an antifungal, basically an anti anti mold prevention strategy. Say if you have it remediated, but you, you know, in your, in your shower or something, is there a kind of light that you know of that you can shine on there on a daily basis or something, which prevents the. Oh, okay. Well, no, well, what I'd be thinking more of is what you call a, photocatalytic oxidation filter now they you they use uv light to basically oxidize the fungus and okay. and microbial particles so they definitely can help like i have an air scrubber that i have in my bedroom which is based on that principle which has uv light bulbs in there so it, it can help in that way i have not heard of or seen any research of using uv light directly onto a source of mold but i'd be interested if you do have some um, information on that okay Okay, uh, I I don't personally, but uh, yeah, I'll look out for it. Yeah, if the, if the person if the person wants to share it, I'm happy to have a look. Oh, okay, okay. Um, right, this person's asking about undermethylation and overmethylation. Uh, ways to correct both as it relates to sulfation and the ability of the liver to handle mycotoxins. Well, in your course, you discuss um, specific supplements, like you were mentioning about the bile flow. You talk about specific supplements which can enhance the way that the body does clear out mycotoxins. You mentioned PC. You mentioned some other things. Um, mm -hmm. You also discuss methylation, but you've you uh, you said that maybe sometimes when you if someone if you feel that someone is under methylating, if you give them methylation support too early, then that can make them worse. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so so that whole under methylation and over methylation concept, I believe, was coined by Bill Walsh, uh, who's a PhD biochemist, and is really talking about the idea that there's a net over or net under. Now, probably a more accurate way of looking at it is that, you know, your methylation pathway can have certain speed ups and certain speed bumps along the way. And um, overall, you may have a tendency to be a bit more um, of a speed bumpy methylation cycle or a bit more of a sped up cycle. And so, you know, he used to look at whole blood histamine levels. You can also use the doctor's data methylation panel to look at that. And the main treatment for under methylation is SAMe, um, which is S adenosylmethionine. And the main treatment for over is actually niacin. Um, as far as I know, he, yeah. So he also uses folate to a certain degree, like just folic acid, which he says actually decreases methylation at an epigenetic level. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do use that approach to some degree, but also just realizing that it may be a bit more complicated in some people. So for instance, you may have an undermethylator who's also got the COMPT gene and they just get a bit agitated when you give them um, methyl donors and so on. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, you may just have to take a look at all the different genes. And yeah, I think if they've still got active viral infections and so on, you probably want to have cleared those first before you start giving a lot of methyl donors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, one more. Do you, do you ever use modified citrus pectin as a binder? Well, I use that more for cancer. That's been shown to reduce the VEGF. Uh, in cancer and also help prote um, prevent uh, metastases and so on. Also for chemicals. So I think there's a different different type is used for chemical toxicity versus uh, cancer. I have not used it for mold toxicity as yet. I have seen some patients who are on it, but I've not seen any literature on it. And I figure why not just stick to the things that are, are known to work. Okay. Uh, your opinion on cell core biosciences products? Well, I use, I use it for parasites, so very useful for parasites. So there's para one, para two, para three, and now there's a para four, I believe. Hmm. Uh, and so they can be quite useful. They also have a useful Tudka product, yeah. uh, which is useful to get the bile going. So I think in CRS patients, using Tudka can be very important. Now, the other thing is it's very important to make sure that you're not constipated 
before using binders. Otherwise, that can make the situation worse. Cellcore do have a useful product called Bowel Mover. Is that, um, is that Mimosa Pudica or is that Para 2? No, that's Para 1. Para 1. <laughs> No, Sorry, I think pa- this, that's they've right. got Bowel so many powers. Is a combination. <laughs> Bowel mover is a combination of different things, includes Senna and other things. Okay. But that seems to be quite useful to get the bowels motion uh, working if you're already using a lot of fluids. Now, they also have a product called Biotoxin Binder, which right. is interesting. And it has, uh, I think it has fulvic acid and other things. Again, I'm more of the belief at this stage that you know, that using the products that have been shown in trials to to be able to take mycotoxins out is a safer way to go. I suspect it, I mean, based on energy medicine testing, it does seem to work in some people, the, the biotoxin binder. Okay. Two more, very quick. Thank you so much for, for doing this, by the way. <laughs> people will be happy. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. Uh... What are the best ways? Okay. Why in some high moisture climate countries like Italy, Greece, tropics, people are not as sick. Everyone still have to sleep and eat indoors, etc. Uh, not sure exactly what that last part means, but I guess they're asking why is it that uh, people, like countries that have mold, are not sicker than they could be, I think. My well, the understanding is, is that not the, as high. Yeah, I get it. I get the question. Um, my understanding is that the construction of buildings is a more important factor than the outside humidity, although that is a minor factor. Where I live in the tropics in Australia, we do just have to run dehumidifiers all the time mm. because it's so humid. But if you've got a humid environment, but your houses are well constructed, then you're not going to have too much of a problem. You might get a little bit of condensation. Um, and if you've got building materials which are resistant to moisture, then even that condensation won't cause a problem. So really, it really comes down to the the, the construction of the building primarily uh, as to how well it can just deal with the humidity. Okay, okay. And this leads to another question, which is if someone sees a small amount of mold, I'll give an example, say on the window pane, you may have, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the silicon that holds the kind of window yep. pane and you may see black spores, which the are kind sealant. of in the sealant. Uh, is that something that they need to be concerned about? If they do have this, this particular individual does have um dysautonomia they've tried a uh, high dose thiamine which oftentimes work for, works for that condition but they've not gotten better they've tried a bunch of other things they think that they may have uh, mold issues um they're wondering whether a small amount of mold is is going to be making them sick well it's a small amount of of visible mold okay so let's just let's just correct that to start with that means a large amount of actual mold Interesting. Let me repeat that. The small amount of visible mold means there's millions of mold spores present. Mm-hmm. So make yeah. So don't think of it as being a small amount of mold. If it's visible, you've got a major problem. Now, if it's just in the grouts in the shower, for instance, that'd be the one exception to that rule. Okay. Because you know that's a wet area already. Okay. You know what I mean? That's a, so that's the one exception, but pretty much anywhere else in the house. Now, that uh, silicon is basically supposed to be sealing the window from any moisture. So clearly it's not doing its job if you're seeing mold on that. That's f- interesting. Would you recommend for someone in that kind of position who does see that, uh, they can go ahead with the real-time labs. Is it real-time labs that do the, um, do the what is it, the hurts me or the hurts me? Like the- Are they... <laughs> Uh, Real time labs do a test called the Emma. Emma. Um, yeah, which sounds like a person more than a test, but um, I'm quite interested in that because it actually looks at, uh, I think it looks at five or six mold species, but then it looks at five or six mycotoxins. So I haven't managed to convince any of my patients to do the Emma yet because I guess it's, you know, it's run out of America as well. But um, I am quite interested in that because in many cases, uh, the mold itself, you won't be able to, uh, won't actually come onto various surfaces, mm. um, but the mycotoxins may go there. So I, I'm, I, I, but the gold standard at this point is still doing an ERMI. Okay. Um, and, and the original lab that was used was Mycometrics. Mycometrics. That's still, that's still the, the lab that I generally recommend. Yeah. You just have to send them a Swiffer cough in the mail. Okay. And, uh, and they'll perform that for you. 
Okay. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, so there's a couple more questions, but a lot of it, so a lot of this is like practical stuff on supplements and things like that. And the thing is, you have, you have basically, I mean, a lot of the information you've given out completely for free. But if, mm -hmm. if people, I mean, if they don't want to troll through like 12 hours of interviews, which you've done, or you've done more than that at this point, um, mm -hmm. There's, there's also a lot of information online in PDFs and survivingmold.com and whatnot. But ultimately, I'd, I'd, I haven't come across anyone who's done a more concise, to the point, and simplified um, layout of the science and simplified layout of the actual progression of therapy in terms of like, like you said, in your practice, you found that certain steps are not necessarily necessary necessarily necessary that's funny uh, are not always needed or they might not be or for instance with the binders you found that for super sensitive people maybe using charcoal bentonite zeolite they all have their benefits um that's something which is not as easy to find online exactly the progression of how you use those things and what other supplements you might use like you spoke about the importance of the bile well it's like okay how can you support using the bile and you laid that out in your course. That's called Mold Illness Made Simple, right? We've spoken about that a couple of times. Uh, could mm. you just give the listeners a rough overview of what that is, why you did it, and how people can find it? Because honestly, uh, that's one of the best things that I found on this, even as a practitioner. I feel as though, like, I, 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 I think it's an excellent resource to go back to. You've got hours worth of lectures on there, but you can basically skip. It's in lots of different modules. And I just thought it was really well done. So could you could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. As I mentioned before, I went through a very long and arduous process about learning um, about mold illness and CRS, having to read a few thousand page documents, etc. And I don't wish that upon anyone. I think if you and what I've noticed is people who are suffering from this are generally very overwhelmed and confused and anxious. And so their ability to take in information is often a little bit compromised. So what we've done in this course is try to just go and explain one concept at a time. So for instance, the first module is what is inflammation, right? And we just go through and we use basically um, images and diagrams to explain the, the, make the concepts as simple as possible. And we make sure you've got that one point before we then go on to the next point. Okay. And I believe that's a very useful way of doing it because at the end point of the, the course, we want the end point to be clarity and confidence. And I believe that in and of itself helps with the limbic part of this illness is just feeling a degree of confidence and, and, and clarity and knowing that you know what you need to do to recover or you know a rough guide at least. And so we cover basically the CRS treatment program we and also the more recent additions to it. You know, so we talk about natural binders, et cetera. We talk about a little bit about treating colonization. We talk about the testing, including things like urinary mycotoxin and serum mycotoxin testing, but it's, it's mainly on the blood tests and the neuroquant. And then we go into talking about the building. So how to look at your building, how to, you know, when you should suspect there's a problem, how you can get it in professionally inspected, how to know that an inspector is properly qualified. So that's a real key there. That's really important because if you get the wrong person to inspect your building, your home building, uh, you're going to be put off and get, you know, potentially get the totally wrong information. So asking the right questions is very important. You don't want to just get anyone. And it's the same thing with rem or even more so with remediating. You've absolutely got to make sure you get the, the right person to remediate your building if you decide to go down that path. And then we talk also about things like, uh, you know, your possessions, what to do with them, how to keep your homes healthy after it's been remediated. That's that's something that's not talked about elsewhere. Then we talk about, there's one module which is all about the uh, brain retraining and uh, emotional approaches to recovering from trauma. Uh, we talk about extreme mold avoidance. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of info there. So it's, it's eight modules. Well, it's nine modules now, actually. It takes you about, I think it'd take you around about 16 or 18 hours to complete the course. You do have to be fairly committed to if to do it. 
But if you think about it, you know, if you do an hour a week over 16 weeks, that'll get you there. Or if you do two, three hours a week, it might be more like seven or eight weeks you can get it done. But yeah, you know, there does need to be a certain amount of time that you put aside every week to get through it. So it's it's not for everyone. If someone's just really wanting to um, put no time into it, mm. then it's not worth doing the course. If you're not willing to really invest in understanding the condition, then it's not worth doing the course. It's really This is really for people who really are dedicated to getting better and to understanding what they're dealing with. And in that case, I'd highly recommend it. There's a lot of people like that though, man. There's a lot of people who have had to get, they've had to become invested. They were never invested, but they've had to because they're the only ones looking out for themselves. You know, their doctors mm -hmm. have basically abandoned them. And and I think this is kind of really what your course, but also other courses th that are like mm -hmm. this are a yeah. way to scale that because you frankly can't see every person in the world with mold. But what you can right. do is you can try get the message out to as many people who are trying to learn about it. And and frankly, you're right. It's a minefield when it comes to learning about CIRS because a lot of it is really technical information. Like a lot of it yeah. is. Um, and to get it uh, condensed down into one place, but also in a way that is understandable, that is useful, not only for clinicians and practitioners, but is also at a level that can be understood for patients, I think is, is, is quite invaluable, especially for the price. It's, it's, you, you do it at a very good price. Um, it's cheap. And so I, I would advise like anyone who really wants to know about this subject, who thinks that they might have a problem with it or thinks that someone they might know have, has a problem with it. Uh, it's, it's really an invaluable resource. Um, something I'd also like to add is that, uh, what was I going to say? I I'll jump in there while you're remembering it. Um, I was just going to say, if you can, if you can prevent making any mistakes on your recovery from CRS, then that's that's worth a huge amount itself. Like, so like an example of a mistake, I've made some mistakes myself. The first one I did was taking my contaminated furniture to the second property. That probably delayed um, my partner and my my ex partner and my recovery. Uh, if you get the wrong inspector or remediator, that's gonna that could hold you back for years potentially and costing you, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. The one big thing about this, I think, is having the best available knowledge so that you can get things right the first time, which is the way you want to do it, rather than making mistakes on your recovery um, from CRS due to lack of proper information. Right. And it's also something that um, if people had willing physicians, if they had willing doctors who are interested but just don't have the information, uh, you've got many slides and things on there that people could print off or they could show, they could give to their doctors to show them. Um, so so it is a really, it's a really good thing that you did. Uh, I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and look, Sandy, uh, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's been like three hours or something. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on here. I mean, uh, I, I put out the feelers for you coming on for an interview and a lot of my followers were super interested. That's where we got a lot of the questions. Uh, the, one of the reasons I, I think you're doing really important work as part of the wider network of people and there's not that many of you, all things considered, compared to the conventional medical system, there's not that many of you who are equipped with the knowledge to be able to radically like revolutionize revolutionize the concept of chronic disease at least for the people who don't really have a voice and that's basically what you're doing you're giving those people a voice because they're being told that it's all in their head oftentimes it's like you said the testing shows up normal uh the majority even functional medicine practitioners will say look there's nothing wrong with your organic acids test so i can't i don't know what's what's the problem with you or why are you responding so negative negatively to this therapy uh, i think what you guys are doing is is just pretty it's just miraculous in that it actually works as well and that's the thing um is that i would hope that at least some of my listeners the people who've tried everything they tried the stuff that i talk about with the high dose b1 the oxalates blah 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 blah, blah it doesn't work um one of the first things that i will say is look you really need to consider cirs you really need to consider it because these things that you've done should work and having this course or something like it to send people to and say look 
learn about that or go see this guy or go see this practitioner or whatever. Uh, it's, it's really useful. Is there anything that you'd like to finish up with? Anything that we haven't discussed or is that everything for this evening? No, I think, I think, um, I think this has been very interesting. Appreciate all your, your good work and your interest. And um, yeah, look, I just want to send my best wishes to anyone who's struggling uh, with chronic illness, it's not easy, but you can get through this. I want to send that out as a little last ray of hope that even if things seem hopeless, there's always a, there's always a way. And and I sincerely hope you find it. That's a really great way to end the show. Then um, we'll call that a day. Thanks again, and thanks everyone for tuning in. And see you next time.